It's July 11th, 2022. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 191 of Rook. I'm Gian Gomeshi, nice to be talking to you. Hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam, Dustan Aziz, Durud Bar Shama. Hello, hello. Uh, really honored to have the great Soli. Uh, Soleimane Vasiqi, we know him as Soli, coming into the Rook studio in, in just a few minutes. He's such an inspiration in so many ways. Uh, the way he has lived his life from the time uh, of being a kid, uh, growing up in a spiritual family in Iran in the 1940s, to becoming a big pop star in Iran in the 1970s, to difficult years after the revolution migrating to italy then canada driving a cab in canada for a couple of decades and his commitment to forging new ground musically and exploring sufi inspired music with his most recent albums back to his spiritual roots you might say he has this amazing story and i think this is his first ever interview uh let alone lifetime interview in english uh, uh, sure, yeah. And um, we, although we agreed that if he wants to speak Persian, he can. But uh, can't wait to have him here in a few minutes. Soli, our big feature in this episode. Also later in the show, Piruz Varaste will be here also in the Rook studio. Iranian-Canadian professional fitness trainer, wellness coach, former European and Canadian champion in karate and bodybuilding. Is it karate or karate? Either one works for me. I feel like I would say karate. But then to sound more karate. official, I want to say karate. Isn't yeah. Didn't Ross say that in uh, French? That's what it's called, karate. <laughs> a former European and Canadian champion in karate. Uh, <laughs> just like, oh, gee, I must do karate. Listen to him say that. Uh, he's also the son of the late legend, Dr. Farhad Varaste. Uh, people will know his name, the father and founder of karate slash karate in Iran. Piriz will be here to tell his story and um, why we should all stay healthy. Speaking of which, uh, by the way, hello, Fabius hi. Kion. Hi, hi, Groovy Shia. Hi, uh, hi. Um, uh, speaking of being healthy, uh, I am such a sloth right now. I So the Iranian-American comedian Maximini mm, was, yeah. has been in town for a few days. Nice to see the lad. And, and he did, uh, I mean, he did like six shows in Toronto, sold out mm. shows and over different nights. And he was in Montreal and in Ottawa. So last night I went to his final show, uh, which was, you know, it's a Sunday night, 9 p.m. And afterwards we go, okay, let's, we got to go somewhere to eat, you know? And so he, he, so Max actually was Googling like here I live in Toronto, but mm -hmm. first of all we were up in Richmond Hill. Mm. No offense to all the beautiful <laughs> people in Richmond Hill, but where are, they, where are you going to eat up? And I mean, if you if you, if you, anyone knows Canadian geography, that's the north of Toronto. And so he Googles and finds a place, uh, a Persian place that's open somewhere way out in Vaughan, mm -hmm. scenic Vaughan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's uh, and the place is called Shaboruz. Shabaruz, uh, night and day. Yes, and uh, and and he actually calls them, and they go hello, and it's like midnight, and he's like, Can "Are you guys open?" He's like, "Not really. Who is it?" And he says, uh, "Maximini" <laughs> or something like that, and they go, "Come," you know. So, <laughs> anyways, we go there and uh, and we sit on the patio, and we had it. <clears throat> it was a great night, but but the whole point of the story is Max. You know, first of all, he's a lean guy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't eat cheese. He doesn't eat bread. He's you know. And he's jumping around the whole night. On he's done, just done a show. He's done two shows. He did two shows last wow. night. So he's hungry. <laughs> I had a meal. I already <laughs> ate dinner a few hours earlier. You know, but uh, so Max starts with that. You know, and he's kind of a big shot, right? So he's <laughs> like, just bring five vaziri and <laughs> some kash kebabim june, and he's just ordering all these things. And I'm kind of like, Ugh, I don't know. Are we gonna do? We really need all that on the table? And there's like four of us. You know, and he's like, no, just bring it, bring. It. So if I don't finish an entire vaziri 
and then a bunch of cash care bought them. Like this is like two in the morning. Oh, I wow. mean, what kind That's of a, a fool? Head. We just had Dr. Rosa Moradi on the show <laughs> last week explaining that we shouldn't even eat a, a morsel of bread. And there I am with the mound of rice and the juje and no the shame. oh. <laughs> so good. But I mean, it's worth that's. It. It's worth it, it. Is it worth it? It is. I mean, I feel the, like a bad person. The quantity of joy that I get from kebab is wow. like, can't I can't. And let's face it, forget two, two in the morning kebab. <laughs> Oof, Come on, it hits right. The but, greasy bread. And Max have? had done the show and everything. And Max, of course, is like eats a quarter of what's on his plate. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, doesn't eat the bread. Just eats the cash kebab of June. And and I'm like. <laughs> 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 the rest of them took things home in boxes, but like <laughs> mine was uh, everything near me was finished. <laughs> oh, it was so good, but yeah. um, and yet so wrong. <laughs> so uh, Peter's Varistay will be here later in the show to tell me probably why I should. And I, I'll just keep bringing people on the show to say no cheese, no bread. You know, <laughs> it until change anything. It really doesn't, though, does it? Mm. We tried, right? I don't try. Oh, I you just haven't accepted. Th- no, I no, accept yeah. kebab and bread. Well, I wanted to think that Max was one of these guys who, you know, eats badly and just happens to have a good metabolism, does these shows, jumps around, is skinny. But the truth is, the guy doesn't need anything. Uh, I mean, he's like, I, I haven't eaten cheese in five years. You know? wow. I'm like, who are you? What kind oh. of a person? You're not funny anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> it's that L.A. mentality. It's because he uh, lives there. Yeah, so. good for him, man. If he's got that kind of discipline, I, I could never give up. The paneer, no the way. nuno paneer. Oh. I mean, the cheese and bread. I mean, oh. what what a, what's a man to eat? What kind of life is that? <laughs> what kind of life is that? Uh, how are you doing, Kian Jun? I'm good. I know this week is uh, there's some, there's a festival that happens uh, every couple of years or every year, a couple uh, of years every in, two years, to every two yeah, years in right. Toronto called Tear Gone, mm-hmm. and then this year it's called Tammuz. I don't know why it has a different name. So. It's because usually Tirgan does a Norus festival during Norus time uh-huh. because of COVID in Toronto. That couldn't happen this year. So we so had to ins- change the name? Instead of having a Norus Tirgan festival, they just moved it to the summertime and renamed it Tirgan Tammuz. Uh, yeah. Oh. There's a lot yeah. of titles this year. <laughs> so, uh, so, but anyway, uh, you've hosted it before. Have you hosted it before? Yeah, you're, that's right. So then the opening night is on Friday and you're mm-hmm. going to be hosting that. That's right. Yeah. Are you going to do it in English or in Persian? In English. English, always. Uh, there's a. Banach, I was kind of hoping. Oh, Banach is going to do. <laughs> Banach Shijun, who we we know, on this show, Tahirian, is yeah. doing it in Persian, and I'm the English. Host. Right, right. They trot you out to do the English. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't you think you should try it in Persian? Oh God, it, I, it, it goes from a class. Salam, to, <laughs> no, 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 no. It, It's supposed to be a classy event. It'll lose class immediately <laughs> if I do it in Persian. Actually, Ali Pars, Doctor Ali Parsa, who was also a host, yes. is the guest of honor. And this year. I'm excited because. Because uh, the um, opening night is Rastock. That's right. And yeah. next, uh, we're going to have Rastock come in the studio. Oh, uh, yeah, nice. I think we're going to uh, tape it on on Saturday or something to perform Beautiful. live in the Rook studio. I can't wait. It's going to be really fun. We are doing these. Um, so good luck this weekend. Thank you. We'll be Thank watching you. it. Uh, so this, uh, the, and I think you're going to shoot some stuff for Rook too. Oh, that's we're going right. to yeah, put yeah. it up on our yeah. on our channels. Speaking of our channels, we've decided as of last week. Well, we didn't decide this last week, but as of last week, we are doing one big show a week Mm -hmm. for the summer so it's the big Monday show we did that last week that's why we've got two big guests this this episode and and a bunch of other uh, um, special gifts for you on this uh, episode so what that means is if you are listening to us on one of our podcast platforms on Spotify or SoundCloud or our Apple podcast or CastBox, um, you get the one show. That's the one show. We hope that you'll take the time to, to listen to the whole thing because you're not getting two a week for now. But, um, and on Instagram, we're not putting up the full show. We're putting different clips. You get the full show on YouTube, however. And then throughout the week on our social media, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Telegram, we put up different clips from the episode. So one big show a week. Savor it. And I don't know. We'll see how it goes for us. Whether we, I kind of missed doing the Thursday show, but at the same time, I also enjoyed the fact that we had the one big show and yes. people were had had a week to digest it, much like the two a.m. Uh, <laughs> juju kebab that I had, the bazari that I need a week to digest. <laughs> we're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms. That's our website, rookmedia.com, and all, at that website, you can not only see all of our different programs, our 
guests, our funnies, our videos, etc. But you can support us by becoming a patron of Rook Media for five bucks or ten bucks a month or more if you wish. Just press the support us button. It really means a lot to us. We crowdsource this. So go to rookmedia.com. A big thank you to Hamid Reza Safi Poor for helping to make this episode of Rook get to your ears and eyes. So Hamid Safipur, Luxury Custom Homes is the name. If you're in the Toronto area or you're an Iranian Canadian, you may know the name Safipur. Hamid got his master's in civil engineering and got into the field of building and consulting on luxury homes over three decades ago. And in the last 20 years, team Hamid and Nina have made the Safipur name one of the tops in the business, a name you can trust to buy your dream land and build your dream home. Safi Poor Luxury Homes have also now teamed up with Remax and they're also doing exotic high rises that are beyond the things we've seen in Toronto before. If you're thinking to buy, sell, build your dream house, if you're anywhere near the Toronto area or are simply interested in buying here, get in touch with Safi Poor, S A F I P O O R, SafiPoor.com, simple as that. Or 416-876-4918, 416-876-4918 at gmail.com. Thanks to Hami Safipur. Now, I happen to know uh, Young Shia. You went to a big stadium show uh, and concert yes, this, uh, yes. this weekend, right? <laughs> it, it, was, it was Roger Waters. You went and yeah. saw the Roger Waters yes, concert. Yeah. Yes. So uh, now... The be, now, did you know this, Keon? Did you know he went to see Roger I did Waters? not, know. All right, well, the, here's the fun part. So <laughs> I want you to tell what happened, because I know you had a, uh, a, f- a friend of ours actually got you a ticket, yes, right? Yes, yes. So yeah. you, and where was the original ticket? So the original ticket was like on the third floor, and a row in the third floor. All like, right. Yeah, yeah. So here's the magic of Shia. Check out what happens. <laughs> so explain what happened. <laughs> so I went there, and uh, I show my ticket to the, uh, um, doorman and he was a very like a old guy 77 like years old and and I was not the doorman or the person at the top of the one of the where, where the, the, the stands like the, in per, the, yeah. the person who leads you to go to find uh-huh, your seat the usher uh, 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 usher yeah, yeah yeah so yeah the usher and so uh, I, it's scotia bank arena right yes scotia and the older guy taking yeah. you probably used to do the hockey games and, and stuff yeah like. and i smiled to him to him and i said that like uh, you know uh, have a good day and i was nice to him <laughs> but I, wa- I i didn't do anything special I, I i just was nice to him but during the like in the in the break in the like intermission the guy came and found me and <laughs> <laughs> and gave me a ticket and he said that because you were so kind to me mm-hmm. to take this ticket and go through the uh, stage like in front of stage so <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> so I went like I, I was like in two meters away from Roger Waters and I see him and it was amazing yeah, it, but that great that's wonderful. Yeah. Only Shia. So what and did you? What, what did you? How nice were you to this man? I mean, what what <laughs> I did you like, say to him? Like, nothing. I just laughed and said, "Like, have a good day and thank yeah. you." And Moral of the story: Always <laughs> be nice to people. Well, or at least <laughs> to the happen. usher at the yeah. Scotia Bank Arena. <laughs> so he comes and he just like randomly finds you. Yeah. And yeah. says, "Here's a ticket to the front of the stage." Yeah, yeah. and he asked. He asked that how many like how many com- uh, accompany do you have? How many hamra do you have? How many yes? <laughs> did he say how many hamra? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. How many ham do you have? But you're not Iranian. That is okay. How many ham um, And I said, no, I'm alone. And he was like, oh, great. So let's oh, go there. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then Wonderful. so was the was it a different concert from the stands than it was from uh, two meters away from Roger it Waters? It was, yes. It was really different feeling. Yeah. When you see the, not not only Roger Waters, when you see the band like mm-hmm. playing in front of you, it's, it's another feeling. Sometimes I don't like being that close up. Like in a big show, because you don't have a sense of the yes. the stage and the the screens yeah. and what's going on. Correct. Yeah. Um, yes. Actually, for Roger Waters, it, it's good to like at some point like be f- further and see the whole show. Mm. So you had the perfect show, first half of in the stadium, yeah, yes, in the s- yes, yes, stands. Yes. It was really good, and also I'm really happy that I went alone. It was an experience that I've never experienced it, and like being. Have you been? Have alone? you ever been to a concert alone? No. Oh. No. I haven't. No. 
But really? I, the, to a concert alone? And they've gone to all kinds of concerts alone. No, yeah. but that sounds wonderful. <laughs> I'll try that one time. <laughs> yeah. No one to have to, you know, right? make small talk with, <laughs> yeah, except yeah. for the other people there. <laughs> no, it was really good. Yeah. Uh, well, Hamas yeah. Karanat, that is fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you got, uh, you yeah. got to wave to Roger there. Uh, a political show, I would imagine, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like attending in a political party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Not so much uh, the Maximini show wasn't uh, the, as political as the Roger Waters show. Uh, more just picking on people in the crowd and, and very funny. He's a he's a, a really funny guy. And, of course, Soli, who's about to come in, mm -hmm. uh, did a performance yes. on Friday night, yeah. which I, I, I got to see uh, uh, an outdoor show, and it was just so wonderful seeing him on stage. Excited to get to Soli. Before we do that, um, I, I just want to mention uh, we can out this. We've been teasing it for a while now. Uh, coming up, August 1st, we are launching a new series a new travel series, which we shot episodes, the first episodes of in London, England last fall. It's coming August 1st. It is called Talking to Persians. Talking to Persians, London. Yes. Uh, and Reza is currently feverishly editing this. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting it all ready to go here. But I should mention that this is not a podcast. This is a, a film. This is a, a video series. So it'll be on our YouTube channel. Uh, but we're really excited for people to see it. So get ready for that. That's, uh, I guess, it's only a couple of weeks away, right? Yes, yes. We launched Talking to Persians. It's only taken us a year to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like... Yeah, that's right. Well, September? It was, was almost a year ago we shot this thing. Yeah. Or was it October? It was September. September. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> in the midst ago. of COVID. Remember you're right, you're right. Yeah. Running around London with our masks on. And, yeah. yeah. Well, no, there was no masks at the time, if you remember. It was weird for us. It but there were in the uh, in the tube and, and stuff. We had to wear, I mean, yeah. now that there's no masks anyway, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the mask era seems like yeah. such a long time ago. Yeah, crazy. Uh, but yeah. Uh, talking to Persians, London, coming up August 1st. Uh, and we'll you'll start seeing promos for that if you follow us on Instagram or any of our social media platforms. Okay, uh, Groovy Shy, the fabulous Keon, we'll see you in a little bit. Let's get our feature guest in here, our first feature guest. I'm excited to say that coming into the Rook studio right now, today we have a real Iranian musical legend. In recent decades, he's been known for his unique blend of spiritual and Sufi styled music. But as well, if you were a fan of the Rango Rang or Mihake uh, Nokrei programs back in the 1970s, you would know our first featured guest. He's an Iranian Canadian singer, composer, songwriter, who was making a big name for himself in Persian pop music before the revolution of 1979. Take a listen to this. <laughs> There you go. The hit song from the early 1970s, Halake Divan Ashodam. That's the voice and musical work of Soleiman Vaseqi, or Soli, as he has been artistically known for many years. Soli was born and raised in Tehran. He studied sociology at the University of Tehran, but his love for music led him to a long life career in creating and performing. He began his career in his early 20s and was quickly introduced to a wider audience as a, a pop singer by Feridun Farahzad. Alongside his singing career, Soli also composed music for himself as well as other legendary singers such as Shahram Shahpareh, Gugush, Leila Furuhar, and Ebi. The 1979 Islamic Revolution eventually caused the exile of Soli from Iran, and he migrated to the West, first to Italy in the 1980s, then to Canada in the mid-90s. But Soli's love for Iranian music has never wavered. In exile, Soli began to conduct extensive research in Persian literature, poetry, and different kinds of music. In recent decades, he's been practicing a wide variety of vocal styles, including spiritual, mystical, Sufi-style works. Soli is just coming off a big outdoor concert here in Toronto this past weekend and right now. Soleiman Vaseri. Soli joins me in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Hello to you, Jean Jean. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you did invite me to be here 
uh, to this conversation and interview and I'm very excited that if you can talk about the you know like a historia <laughs> <laughs> Your 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 history, your <laughs> distinguished history. It's such a pleasure for me to see it you. Is, I I have wanted to do this a long time, and uh, we agreed beforehand that we're going to do this in English. I get if you want to uh, answer in Persian at some point, you're welcome to do that. Although I know your English is very fine because you've been here for uh, really many poor. years. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Although I do notice that you've cut your hair. Yes. Have you? Are you becoming a serious person now? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, I had this, some illness, and uh, I was in the hospital, and so. Uh-huh. And uh, after that, I find out that my hair is uh, losing my. Oh, hair. it's falling out. Yeah. Oh. And uh, try to cut it off because I had a long, long hair. You're you know? known for the long hair. <laughs> I've only ever known you with long hair. Yes. But now it, I'm I'm happy with it. It's so easy. You're very professional now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Uh, uh, what's it like performing live again after the um, the break that the entire world took for COVID? Um, how does it feel to be preparing and doing concerts again? Yeah, that's that's very exciting. I can, because. I did a lots of uh, live uh, performance, live concerts, live uh, even recording, live recording on the stage yes. when I was um, doing the concert and so, and I did it a lot, and I like it because you are facing with the people, and uh, in my case, I don't want to, you know, I don't like lots of people, you know, thousand people, but around 500 800 people that you can communicate with them mm. you can look at them you can share something with them and ask him to share with you and come to uh, sing with you maybe sometimes mm-hmm. and this is a, a very very uh, good good moment that you know i'm trying after two three years now because of corona and so uh, this is the first time and i'm very happy it makes you um it feeds your soul, feeds your energy to be able to be in front of people? Uh, you know, in this uh, last two weeks that we were uh, rehearsing and yes. practicing and so, every other day I felt more ready to do that. You mm. know? And uh, right now I, I feel very good because uh, I decided, you know, because of the suggestion of two of my musicians, uh, that uh, after years and years, maybe 45, 40, mm-hmm. like 50 years, uh, I'm going to sing one of those two old songs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one is hard. Yeah. Kid, one is well, hard. I'm going to ask you about Well, uh, let me ask you about it right now. Okay. Because uh, it's, it was interesting to play that. Exactly. What with you sitting here. Yes. Because it's obviously a, a long time ago, mm-hmm. and it's even a... A different phase of your life, your pop music phase. What do you think about when you hear that song back? I was watching you as we were playing that song. You closed your eyes, your head was moving. What were you thinking about? You know, uh, all of the songs that I sang it till now, there is a moment that you are getting involved with it and uh, getting something that's going under your skin. Mm. And um, this feeling, whenever you hear it, it's coming back to you, you know. How can you want to me? You know, one of the songs that uh, in Hazard She Sadu Pine, Joe Pine, two years before revolution, three years 77, before. 77, right. Yeah, I, I had a uh, journey to Afghanistan mm. with my girlfriend, that she's my wife for 45 years now. Uh, we were in. Uh, in Afghanistan, in Kabul, and uh, we visit uh, the legendary uh, music, Afghan music, uh, Jalil Zaland, mm. Mr. Jalil Zaland Ustad and uh, his wife and family. They invited us, and uh, he get, bring the musician because uh, we were asking that we need a, a robot and tabla to buy and uh, take it with us. <laughs> And the musician with the robot and the tabla was there, were there and 
having a beautiful night in morning. Mm -hmm. And I had a uh, tape recorder, small tape recorder uh, with me, and I recorded, recorded whatever happened that night. And when I came back to uh, Iran, uh, I made uh, s some of those melodies uh, mm. for the recording. One is Hal Kedivan Shun and Mirabi. And one is Golisi. Yes, another hit. Some of them uh, is in that album uh, incident war, uh, mm -hmm. that we recorded Re released, yeah. exactly the time that the revolution was yes, uh, yes. Uh, all those songs was hit you know yes everybody liked it everybody everybody knows that song knows that song. by the way hala kid you want to um now that i've become crazy right is yes. that the translation yeah uh, <laughs> and and uh do you but i'm curious when you listen back to that um given the all of the music that you've made in the ensuing decades, very sophisticated music in some cases, very deep spiritual music. Do you listen back to this and roll your eyes a little bit like, oh my God, that was such silly pop music, or do you love it still? Uh, 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 I love it still, but um, uh, was not the music that I could rely on it and g grab it with me that I'm mean, this singer, I'm this. I was more than that, you know. Mm. Um, I couldn't stay f for. You don't feel like it showcases everything that you can do. Yeah, it's you know, one side of you. Exactly, and mm. I uh, did try many things, many other uh, style of the music, mm. uh, like a very modern music, like a, m b uh, making a uh, song, uh, composing on the. Uh, a new form of the uh, poetry mm. uh, in Iran, like yes. a Sorab Seperi yes. and so And uh, this is what uh, happening to me. I started from very childhood with uh, singing Quran. Yes. Later on, Rudakhi Hall, the opera hall that was opening, yes. they were, uh, you know, hiring the choir. And I had a voice, I, passed the exam, and I went to the choir, uh, opera choir, mm. and in there, I learned solfege, note, music, uh, and seven years of... Uh, How did you get into the choir? I had a neighbor who was accounting in for Tutalar Daiki, and he, he was always listening to me. I'm singing and running and playing mm -hmm. and going on. Uh, and came to me and said, Talar is he's uh, hiring Looking for, for the choir, <laughs> and you have a voice, you should try it. And I asked my father, and my father, right away, go, go, go. And but ha go. hang on a second, because I have to tease this part of the story out, because it's very interesting to me. Because you first come to public attention in a big way in the 1970s as a pop singer, but you were born in the 1940s into a very spiritual family. In fact, I, I, I feel like looking at your life journey, the kind of music that you are involved in in, in the recent decades yeah. is much more return to where you, who you were when you were first born and when you were first growing exactly. up. Exactly. Tell me first, because you describe it as a spiritual upbringing, a spiritual family, mm. which sounds different from religious, Mm -hmm. uh, is it what tell, tell me what you how you describe a you spiritual know, uh, family there is nothing talk about that much about it ah. you know uh, when you uh, you are growing in the family with the old tradition and all the situation they have my father was a big sufi mm. and uh, and he, he was open you know uh, my sisters uh, all university uh, and without any cover and he so was a Roshan Fek very uh, Roshan Sufi. Fek, right, very right. very clever and uh, this uh, is in your gene like mm. and when it's uh, something from out that is calling you mm. you can get it you get it and you go after it and this is my situation after revolution I stay at, at in Tehran. Yes. 
because I said, okay, something is changed. I have to see what is going on. And I have a lots of invitation from New York, Cabaret Darvish, and from Los Angeles yes, here and yes. there. And I said, no, I want to uh, be here. Sergeant, let me come back to that. Mm. Let me, I want to come to the after okay. the revolution because it's a big, a big moment for you. Mm. But before that, so this spiritual kid who goes to this, I want to, I want to draw the line of how we go from the spiritual kid to the pop singer on Rango Rang because mm. it's very interesting to me how how that evolves. So you were at, we were at Rudecky Hall. Yeah. you're in the choir. Yes, Where yes. do you first start getting involved with pop music? Uh, when I was in university, I was uh, in university, uh, I have a bachelor degree of the sociology. Sociology, uh, yeah. <coughs> when I was in the... By the way, why didn't you study music in university? In the I don't know. <laughs> d d d this is, uh, sometimes I think that I was, if I was going to the like a, um, conservatoire uh -huh. and sing, uh, d d uh, learn music, I could do many things. Mm. I don't know. I don't or know. you might be less special. Maybe it would have put parameters on your creativity. Yeah, you know, could, it would have yeah. suppressed you somehow. I right? know, I know. I'm not sure but what happened. Hmm. In university, I had a chance to go to, they call it, um, there was some uh, musician famous there. Ostad Parviz Atobaki, mm. Dr. Reza Norman, and uh, uh, lots of people, and... University of Tehran? University of Tehran, yes. And uh, they made a choir there, mm -hmm. and I was there as well. We rehearsed two operas, Takht Jamshid, and the others, Fateh Babel. When we say opera, Yeni, opera, 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 and with the big orchestra, okay. and the conducting bit was... Do you want opera? In Taradeki, when, uh -huh. when I went to the Taradeki, you were singing, singing opera, opera wow. choir, okay. opera, and some small uh, roles. Uh, Even more interesting that you end up on Rangarang. So, <laughs> 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 so this is where I'm going. Keep yeah, going. Yeah. That, that was a uh, good uh, term of time that I had because mm. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. But in university, with the conducting of uh, Ustad Svandiyar Mufarizade, we rehearsed operas, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a huge experience for me. Yes. And for the, the university, because the preparing for the uh, that night was one year. Wow. And we uh, played in the front of uh, Shah and uh, Farah. Shah Yeah. Uh, this would be the 1960s, I guess, right? Uh, I cannot. Well, you're you're probably in your early 20s when you're doing. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. yes, yes. That's right. So, so how do we go from there to your first hit? I have to play a bit of this because it's very funny to me. Yeah, Hamadi Fil is oh, your first hit song yeah. in 1971. You know. can, can I play a little bit of that? Oh yeah, go ahead, sure. child. Play this a little bit of this is Soli from 1971. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. So that's 1971. By the way, I don't know. I have no. I. 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 I was uh, singing, I was young, and I was going to Koche Javanan uh, here and there. Uh, yes. And uh, with the other musician, young musician around, you were playing music and so. By the way, you're a kid from a spiritual family who's just sung in an opera. Yeah. And, uh, and now we, we get to this song. So yeah, exactly. it's amazing, the, the, yeah. the style variety. Exactly. It, it, it's very upside down. <laughs> <laughs> but 
I was going to the Kakha Jawanan and singing uh, with the other musician. There was a young musician there, beautiful pianist and uh, composer, uh, Mansour Iran Nejrat. Mm. He was very talented. And uh, the story is, they gave him this poetry that he has to memorize it. Okay. okay? And for memorizing that poetry, he started to make a song on it. And when the song is coming and it's written, there is a place that we need something to repeat as a tarjima. Mm -hmm. At the time, he was reading a book. <laughs> the book is Hamadi Fil, written by Aziz Nesin, the big writer, Turkish writer. Okay. Aziz Nesin wrote this, and he was singing, uh, uh, reading. Uh, uh, Does it mean something in Turkish, Hamadi Fil? No, no. Hamadi Hamadi Fil is like a like a. Did you ever heard about the Goose Post? Goose Post the North Dome. Oh yeah, Gush the hunch, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yeah. yeah. This Hamadi Fil uh, character. Oh, it was a name. It was a name. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is the, is the same character as Goose Post. <laughs> Big uh, body, goosh here. Right, and, right, and, right, and right. Have it, have it, have it. Yes, yeah. yes. Mansur put this name as a repeating uh, chorus chord, chord, yeah. choir in between this song. And I <laughs> and I sang it. And I was in university. I was in summer camping uh, for the uh, students, mm -hmm. university students from around it, Iran. Mm. Doctor and Pesar. Mm. And I was singing this melody with the uh, Sudian orchestra that we had. Mm -hmm. And from the Radio Daria, uh, Mr. Shahrukh Naderi mm -hmm. and a few people like that saw me that I'm singing and the uh, students are, are very happy. No way. Me. They yeah. discover you at the camp. Yeah. <laughs> and they uh, ask me to go and record this song. And Parviz Atabaki, uh, uh, God bless him, he has a studio, Studio Tanin in Tehran. And he asked us, come to my studio and recording this song. And we were recording and then after I went to the radio and TV and uh, the Yale. You become a pop star. Yes. I mean, you're, there's, you know, we can still watch it on YouTube. You're on all these TV shows and you're, you've got these hit songs. That must have been quite a transition for you. You're, you're, you're big one, big yeah. time, yeah, yeah. But because uh, uh, somehow changed my career. I didn't go for the whatever I I study in university. Right, right. <laughs> you know. So let I me let me ask you this, but you know. We've we've done a lot of, about music on this show, and 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 about the history of what happened in the 20th century with music, and especially popular music, pop mm -hmm. music in Iran, and and the really difficult stuff that happens after the revolution, the decimation of the pop music, and there's no industry yeah. at all in the 80s and 90s after the the Islamic revolution. Um, we tend to think of the 1970s as this amazing fertile time where um, popular music, pop musicians, artists like yourself, um, like some others, are, are emerging. And it seems like there's the growth of something really exciting and promising. In other words, it seems like a really, really great time to have been a pop singer in Iran before the revolution. Was it, was it as good as it seems? Uh, exactly, because uh, there was an opening or a starting like a TV. Sazaman mm. uh, radio television. Uh, sure. Mainly yeah. Iran. Yeah. The national these TV are, radio. Uh, these yeah. are uh, the big opportunity that has having a, a different shows, like a Rangarang, like a Mikhaki Nogre, as you said, and like a Karib Afshar uh, show. And, and I, I was in all of them. That was the opportunity, and there is a bunch of chance, and the, uh, some young musician, good musician, yes, uh, uh, that 
who could make a melody, make a songs, or who can good, uh, you know, acting and uh, rehearsing the music, yes. you know. Uh, there are beautiful, and that was a good chance and good opportunity for years. Yeah. And after the revolution, uh, this situation is completely changed. I don't know. You have you want to? We'll get to that. Struggle. You you okay. were also you become this pop artist that's well known. Um, you're singing solo stuff. You're performing with Abby, etc. You're but you're also writing for yeah. other. Tell me about where the composing part came in, where, yeah. where you start to become the guy writing songs for Gugush or for Abby. This is a good story. At the night of my marriage, there was a few uh, Afghan guests in my list. Mm -hmm. And one of them was uh, Mr. Ahmad Vali, one of the f mm -hmm. very famous. And uh, Mr. Farid Zaland, mm -hmm. at that time he was playing tabla with me in the Kabare, uh, Miami and Bakara and so. Farid Zaland was playing tabla. Farid, tabla with me, yeah. <laughs> okay. and yeah. yeah. Uh, he's a good, good guy. He's a good musician. Yes, of course. Uh, but I think of him as a keyboardist or as a piano player. No, piano he, player. But he, at the he time, was he was playing yeah, yeah. tabla as well, yeah. And Ahmad Valley was uh, playing the music uh, for the guests with the harmonium mm -hmm. that he had. Right there, I bought that harmonium from him. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I On said, your wedding night? Yes. Mm. I want to buy this instrument. <laughs> and he sold it to me. And with that instrument, that was the first instrument in, in my life that I had. Mm. And I had it in, in my house and playing with it and uh, do something. And uh, I started to make a song for myself. One of them was uh, on the Hafiz poetry. Mm -hmm. ای باد نسیم یار داری زن نفخ یه مشوار داری <coughs> And at the time uh, there was a guy in Iran uh, French Brazilian and he was one of the that who understood me very good mm. and he started to uh, arranging the melody for me and then after I made a song for Khanum uh, Gugush. He uh, arranged it, and uh, uh, I made a song for Abby that I think this is one of the best melody I, I made. Which song was that? Uh, it's Shabbat uh, Zachri. Manoto bo labeteshe panechaste labeyek. چشم رسیدی پیش رومون آب زمزم سختیم اما قطریم هم شب زحمی was a, uh, a title of the movie that myself I had uh, investing the money in there me and uh, Eric the guy can French Brazilian he made a song, music for the movie mm -hmm. Shabe Zachmi and I made this song based of this song he wrote for the you know, whole score wow I made another one for Abby and Nelly mm -hmm. and for Arif but the, at the time we were recording in the studio Arif couldn't attend and the part of RF and, and ask Abby to s you sing it. Wow. And Abby, uh, Abby uh, sang the uh, RF part. And Khoda I'm, I'm Sure, yeah. Saying, I mean, uh, the amazing thing is that at this time, like all of these names are icons now, you know, yeah, of, of Persian yeah, music. Okay. And you guys were all hanging out together, <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> running around together, making yeah, songs, they, singing songs together. It's it's always amazing to me. Yeah, and somehow. You, you were, d d just to make sure I've got this correct, did you sing at your wedding with Farid Zalong oh, playing yes. the tabla? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was singing, and uh, and uh, Mr. Farrokhzad was there as well. 
Verder doen. En ik knew dat hij kan make a mess. <laughs> you know? And I ask if you are a friend of mine that you guys keep an eye on wherever him. Wherever he right. goes, you go with. <laughs> Had you you'd been on his show by this point. Oh yeah. So he was a friend Su- and, and, and such a good friend, such a talent guy. Mm. Oh my goodness. And um, um he was like a very serious guy for the production and acting. When he's coming in the front of the camera, <laughs> right, smile right. coming right. out. Buoyant personality. Oh, yes. my beautiful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I wish I had uh, um, been a little older and had the chance to, to, to visit him, meet yeah, him or yeah. you know, interview him. It would have been incredible if he was still around. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of this sounds like, again, such a... Um, such a time of of excitement, positive energy. It's kind of like um, when we had Faramaz Aslani on the show, and he's talking about his debut album is two years before the revolution, and CBS Records is there, and there's all this excitement in Tehran. And and your case, Soli, is is really another one of the most heartbreaking when it comes to Persian pop music. You are this rising young star. Then, as the revolution of 1979 is happening. Islamic Republic basically decimates pop mm. music um, for at least a decade mm. or more. Yeah. Uh, tell me, take me back to when you realized that with all this potential, with all this excitement, with all this newfound stardom, with with all the musical, the creative juice that you're getting from all of mm. this, that suddenly overnight your career is pretty much over because of the change in the, uh, the uh, government yes somehow but uh, you know I had a, a beautiful friends musician friends from the childhood uh, one of them is uh, Mr. Kamran Khashe suddenly Kamran went to the Italy and Florence and now he is a professor <laughs> music mm-hmm. music mm-hmm. And at the time that I, I was telling you out there about the revolution, mm-hmm. about the revolution, the time that everybody was in, in the streets, who robbed the shore and so and so, Kamran came to visit Iran at the summertime mm-hmm. and asked me, there is a musician lady, Italian lady, in, t- in Tehran tonight. Can you book the or- uh, studio? And what she, she's playing? Tampura, Indian, uh, mm. Indian instrument that they keep uh, playing just a chord sound, you know, back, background sound. And I booked the studio and we went to the studio. incident uh, album it's after that night the lady went and tomorrow night at two two three, three nights I we, we went back to the studio with those songs that I told you that we were in Afghanistan a cappello uh, we start to play and sing defiantly but you couldn't release these songs I mean, you don't go to Italy until 1986. Yes. So for six years, seven years, you're in Iran, and uh, what what that time? What, what, what was that time like for you? Yeah. You know, uh, the bar when it was ready at the time, uh, we uh, uh, distributed with the cassette mm-hmm. at the time, and after that, after the revolution, no, I didn't have any chance to sing here and so. But I was happy that something happened. I, I, I want to see what is going on, but terrible. Hmm. 
uh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> anyway. So, so when you're still in, I, I'm curious why you didn't leave Iran sooner. You could have, I mean, there were people who left right at 1980. Go to L.A., go to somewhere, you know. And you, you I, stay for a while. Yes. I, I mean, some didn't leave. Of course, years, famously, yeah, Gugush yeah, didn't yeah. leave, you know. But you stayed for a while, and then you go to Italy. Tell me why you stayed in the beginning. Um, why, as I told you, because I, I, I was very surprised with this changing. Mm. And I was waiting to see any result of it, you know, what is going on and what's going to happen and then after, uh, story is too big, too much. I had a, a club, mm. video club, at that we were renting the video people and selling the uh, video cassettes? Video, video, mm. video, uh, Betamax, and yeah, VHS yeah, and video, so videos, yeah. We were selling it uh, as a gachak. Illegally, yes. And one night, they robbed my club. I, I had Sorry, this is after the revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of audacious, isn't it? I mean, you're solely the people know who you are. Yeah. And you're you're doing this stuff. I mean, uh, it's, it's you dangerous. Know, right? They robbed this club that I had it to Shari. To and they robbed everything. Mm. And I bought like this, nothing. I, do, I don't have anything. Then after, I started another club. Hmm. And the second time, they robbed me again and they tried to kill me. Who, who was this robbing? I don't know. I don't know. Some people came with the car and hit me and I lost my time all of the robots tendons in my mm. left foot i lost my teeth i uh, in a coma i wake up in the hospital after that i said no there is no place to live here to be here oh my god wow what a and the I, ups and downs of life huh yeah and i went to the uh, Italian embassy and the Iranian people working there, they knew Recognize me, you? recognized me, and right away gave me the visa. And I came out and went to the Italy to see that Kamran Khaje. Mm. And uh, in the Florence, uh, we went to the studio and we went to the studio and recording the album of. Up water. Yes, yes. It's based on, you know, sort of Seperi yes. and, and, and so And then after, with that album, I went to the Los Angeles. To Los Angeles, when I said I want to uh, distribute yeah. this, this album, everybody laughing at me. This is not making any money for you. Whether you are crazy or whatever. And I said, I decided. I, I, I have my decision and I don't want to sing any of the old songs. Mm. This is my way. And when uh, it's done, it came out with the cassette at the time. My wife and children, uh, they, they arrived uh, in Turkey and they to Canada and I came to Canada as well and I said I don't want to come over here. like 
the easy thing to do. I don't want to take anything away from the pop stars who mm. did their work in the 80s and no, 90s no. in LA. But the easy thing for would be for Soli to go to Los Angeles and make some shisha hash music. And exactly. Exactly. So, so you chose the a more difficult path. Yeah, because because did you ever have a moment where you thought maybe I should just go mm -hmm. and start making never. music with Andy or whatever? I mean, you know. Never, because uh, right now at this time I am uh, thankful of God. For two reasons. One, how he helped me to come out from there. And then after, how he helped me and pushed me to come to Canada. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, this is a story that when I came here, I started to experience something else, distributing the magazine. Mm -hmm. Here with the Mr. Hassan Zerehi, I'm sure you yes, know sure. him. And the other guy, Bijan Binej. We started a new magazine, Saiban. And we take the Saiban name from the Sorab Seperi, because it has a beautiful poetry in, in the name of Saiban. And we distribute this uh, Saiban for three, four years. And uh, that was a very artistic and cultural uh, magazine. But it's it's a trade-off. Yeah. It's a trade-off because you know that the L.A. route could have possibly made you a lot of money. And the safety of having the cushion of, you know, yeah. the money and all of that. Yeah. Um, and you end up, let's let's be real about this too, which is uh, um, you're, you end up driving a taxi for many years in Toronto. And I, which I... I don't want to take anything away from taxi drivers. I think it's a very, very honorable profession. But that's tough work. It that's is. That's tough work. It is tough 10 work. to 12 hours a day, yes. seven days a week, from what I understand, yes. you were driving a cab. Yes. Solely the pop star yes. comes to Toronto and for two decades drives yeah. a cab. Exactly. A lot of people would see that and think that's a really hard turn in your life. Yo, every, everybody could see that and uh, uh, say that it's a crazy guy. He is a crazy, goddamn crazy, that you are working on behind a taxi and you can go on a stage and him. Da, 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 and what do you? Money. How do you respond to that? The response is, I was myself. Mm. I was free of any uh, obligation here and there. Um, money from the cover. And I, I didn't like to go to the cover again. I used to sing it in Miami cover, whatever, other one. But I, I didn't want to go because I, I, I felt I can't do something else. Mm -hmm. I can't do something else. And I started uh, here, I found out the, the Hanra, uh, uh Sufi house. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I started to go there and I realized that what was my father talking about? And the spiritual path. Yes, it is. And because of this uh, driving a taxi, that was at some moments that you are by your own. I taxi. was going to ask you what yeah. you learned from being a cab driver. A lot, a lot. Tell me, tell a me, lot. tell me what you learned. Because you, you did it for how long? Twenty-two. Twenty-two years. years. Yeah. Uh, because we have to have some money to live. Sure. My, my, my wife working hard and I was working. You would, have met, you would have met a lot of interesting people over 22 years. <laughs> <driving a cab. laughs> yes. Tell me, tell me what you learned. You know, uh, when you are going to, after the Sufism uh, lessons and experience, it's telling you that you should, re you should try to relieve from your own thought mm. and your uh, uh, your uh, ego uh -huh. you know and in that time I was doing it because I was solely trapped yes. but I could see myself poor baby you know and that was a time that I, I, I was find myself big 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 time it's amazing you know and uh 
in the Chonera as well, I started to sing. To sing with the uh, people who are playing um, Iranian style music, mm -hmm. sonati, music sonati, and uh, with Daf and so on. And I started to sing with them uh, a cappello. Open the book, and whatever it's it, they are playing, uh, I try to sing with them. It's 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 such an inspiring. Uh, honestly, I mean, it's really sitting here listening to your story. It's very inspiring to me, a story of a man who's committed to um, being honoring himself. Yes. He wants to be rather than w material goods or what society expects you to be or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, but w along the way, were there were there times when you were angry? Were there times when you were sad or pissed off? Like, look at what's, uh, you know. It's everybody. Vaziat I, I was this star in the yes. 70s, and yes. because this revolution yes. happens, exactly. and I exactly. now I'm driving a cab. Exactly. And but, you know, what I learned, whatever is happening is in not your hands. It's happening, and you are to qatiye unt ittifaq خود اتفاق یه جورایی ولی نمیدونی چی میاد یه مسئله هست تو ایرانی میگن که هر چی که اتفاق افتاد سب کن ببین نچشی چی میاد و این اتفاق من تجربه کردم I experienced it But saw... you do make decisions along the way Oh yeah We talked about it I mean you decided not to go to LA Exactly You decide to drive a cab Yes you, There's other jobs you could yes. do I mean so it's not just what's happening to you No It's what you're making happen too Yeah but uh, At the time of decision There is something happening to you hmm. That this is not in your hand As I told you I'm thankful to God that pushed me from Los Angeles to here. Because right now I can tell you that you, you've seen a lots of mess in Los Angeles mm. in between the big, big artists. Yeah. Being a big artist doesn't necessarily mean you're happy. No, no, they're, they're, they're happy, they're making money, and they don't care, I don't know. But I couldn't do that. This is me. But after that, whatever I made it, I wrote it, I, I, I composed, it's completely different than yes. the, the, whatever you, you are li listening to from the Los Angeles is different. <laughs> yes. Let me play a little bit of that. Please. I want to play something. So as we've talked about, after the revolution, the, the, the music that you are you embody and you become attracted to and you play and you write decidedly becomes more, I would say, Eastern, more New Age, more poetic, even flavors of Indian Sufi music, um, New Age albums that you that you make that are inspired by the poetry of Rumi, Hafez, uh, Rudaki. Um, let me play a little bit of, I, I love this. This is a 2012 performance of a piece called Golzar Damidast. Golzar Damidast. This okay, is okay. Rumi, right? Yeah. Let's, let, let me pl yeah. play a little bit of this. Yeah. This is live uh, yeah. from 2012. This is from this album, Banging okay. Camel Rainbow. <laughs> I get chills listening to that. I think it's amazing. From 2012, along with the Iranian National Choir and Orchestra, that's Suleiman Soli Vaseri, and the piece entitled Golzar Damidast, uh, based on a poem by Rumi. Tell me about that okay. piece. Uh, this is the uh, uh, 
uh, one of the songs from the third album after Revolution. Third album in the name of Rainbow. That I uh, made them uh, here in Toronto. I composed them. And uh, I didn't have anybody to uh, share with them or uh, ask him to do the arrangement for me and so. And uh, <laughs> this is a big story. Anyway, I, I found a guy. There's always a big story. It is a story. <laughs> but that's it. It's awesome. Every you've got a lot of great stories. Don't don't exactly. please tell them. Yeah, my my uh, nephew was uh, uh, getting married in Washington D.C. and uh, asked me to go there, and I put my harmonium in the car and. With the, one of my, my friends that who could play a little bit tombak. Okay. Not we, Farid Zolan. He's not no, playing no, tombak no. this time. We went to the uh, this wedding party. At the wedding party, we were about five, six uh, family of the damad groom and big 20, 250 uh, guests of the, uh, <laughs> the bride. bride. And ask me, Mr. Soli is here, sing. With the harmonium and this tone back, we start to sing. And in the middle of the singing, I saw that one of the, this film bardari trees, that are film bardari mukhanan, it's zooming on me badly. <laughs> <laughs> the After, videographer for yeah, the wedding. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And when it's, it's done, finished, the guy came to me and said, uh, I was uh, one of the uh, cameraman in the t TV t Iran oh, before wow. the revolution. And I realized you that uh, uh, I know you. What are you doing for now? I know the guy. He's a good musician. I want to introduce, uh, introduce to, to him. Okay. Introduced to him and I gave some of my songs, the op, uh, album and Vogue, he brought it to him to Washington. The guy listened to it, called me. I want to work with you, Ferran, and invited me to uh, Washington. And uh, in the middle of the winter, with the boss mm -hmm. and Boxe Harmonium mm -hmm. and Basse Harmonium, I went to Washington to the Mr. Jamshid Bostoni uh, house. And they got very excited and so, 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 and it started to uh, arrange these songs for me. And uh, we made this, uh, this uh, and uh, distributed here and there. And that was a... Um, when you, with something like this, um, Gorzar Damidast. Mm. Do you? Uh, it's it's different from writing a pop song. I mean, you've got this poem, this great poem from yeah. Rumi. Do you actually sit down at a keyboard or with your tar or something, or or are you imagining the melody? I mean, how do we go from that poem to what we just heard you know, with the orchestra? Uh, uh, I know a little bit play piano, uh, yeah. um, harmonium and here and there. And I made the song when, when I was with the jam sheet. Jam sheet suggesting me come and uh, we change the rhythm. We put it. The, uh, they call it rhythm lang. Mm. This is a, 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 a in this rhythm is on five. Normally is on six, on four, on two. There is no in Iranian style music. Sunnati. You can hear more lang uh -huh. uh, uh, rhythm, but not in pop. In, yeah, no, in, in of course pop, not. Yeah. But but the melody na, 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 is that is that you? Yes, I love it. But do you do you write it? Do you just come up with no, it in no, your head? No, I, 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 I know that I can write the note, but yeah. there is no need. Yes. When I make it, I sing it. I can't sing, sing it. And uh, the jam sheet, write it down. And do and you, when you read the poem, I mean, that probably wasn't the first time you read that Rumi poem, but say it was, uh, do you hear the melody in your head? 
Where does it come from? Yeah, the, somehow. The, the, do you remember that I told you I made a song for A.B. Chavez? Yes, Ahmed? yes, of course. I was sleeping. <laughs> but believe me. You, I you was, saw it in your sleep. I was in bed, and I had these uh, uh, boards. And I, with the words, I made it. And made it, and I started tomorrow morning, play it on the uh, instrument, and came out. Yeah. Uh, you, let me tell you something about art. Yeah. Art is uh, origin, is in the gene, in, in your body, in your head, in your soul. You cannot uh, teach art. Whatever you can teach is technique, is, uh, you know, whatever, the technique of singing or playing. But you cannot play, uh, teach him how to make a song, how to do the, this. You can't teach creativity? No. Wow. No. Does that, wouldn't that mean that only some people can be artists? Yeah. You don't believe everybody could be an artist? Can, oh, everybody can do something, right. not musician. <laughs> and not they uh, right, do right, the right. music. They, they can. Uh, but some of this you're saying is, um, is innate, is, is natural. Yes. It comes in the, in yes. the, in the DNA. Yes. It's not something that we can socialize, that we can learn. Uh, no, no. If you learn something, um, uh, the, the instrument playing up, if you had it in the in your mm -hmm. gene, it's come out. It's you, coming out. It's interesting that you should say that because I feel like some of the some of the newer music when I make when I see you make it, um, I feel like it's almost. I don't want to overstate this. I don't, like I, I romanticize it somewhere, but I feel like it's transcendent. Like you are somehow spiritually involved um let me play a, a piece from 2017 called I don't, let me say i don't know if i'm saying this right de la uh, didara. Didara, yeah. yeah uh it, let's play a little bit of this mm. this is uh, solely um live in 2017. <laughs> So it's amazing to me when I watch the video of you singing yeah. that um, and see you live, your eyes are close, you're <laughs> cross-legged on the floor. It almost feels like, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm, you're not thinking about technique at that moment. You're involved in the music. Yeah. Your voice is like an instrument. Is it is it a different um, soli than the guy who would be singing the pop song in the 1970s? More mature. I'm the same soli. But now I know better. I know a few things more. I can feel it, 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 some things more than before. I can get touched. I can touch, hmm. you know. I can uh, sing. I can good, be a good listener. When you are listening, um, your value is not the less than the singer. When you are a good listener, you are an artist. You are an artist. Uh, I'm the same. I'm, uh, there is no difference in me. But uh, but when you're performing that song, Soli, mm -hmm. how much are you thinking and how much are you feeling? There is no thinking time there. You know, 
it's uh, more than uh, more than thinking. It's uh, out of uh, out of anything. It's it's craziness. Mm. Like <laughs> I'm telling you. When you how like a divine show that like yes it's <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a like a divine show that divine year this is the uh, craziness yani uh, actually when you sing such a songs when you are singing pop music there is no craziness in pop music because is every night repeating mm. repeating 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 but this, in this case There is no take heart. Repeat this. Wow! If you do it uh, tonight and one more, one month later in another place, it's gonna be different. It's improvisational to a certain extent. Like a, it's like a improvisation. It's not exactly improvisation, but you can feel it that sometimes you can change the things. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sounds like you would get bored singing the same songs the same way every oh, night. Oh, terrible. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I hate uh, Texas repeating. I don't like it. No. It's, it's, it's such a pleasure getting to it's do this mine. with you. I, I, I am so um, enamored by your story, by you, by your gentility by your um I, I, it is i've been looking forward to doing this and it has been everything that i could desire um let me ask you a couple of final questions Please. in terms of the way you see yourself you come across as very humble you know um i i introduced you as a legend yeah do you do you believe you're a legend not really But you know, uh, when you uh, uh, name me like this, you are looking from out, out of me, outside. You are, uh, you are not looking just at me, me and my production. You are watching me with the whole picture. But I'm a very simple, very humble guy. And uh, whatever I learned learn from Sufism is to be dust. What do you feel like you still want to um, accomplish musically? Accomplished? What do you mean? Good question. I don't know. What do I mean by accomplish? What What on your musical journey do you still strive for? Uh, you know, I never decided to do this, to do that, whatever it comes, whatever it came to me. And when you, uh, when you let yourself humble and be, be easy, uh, you, can, you have a chance to, a few things come to you, you get this, But push it back this way. This is the situation I have. Right now, I have a, a few ideas if I get a chance. Uh, to recording uh, those things is different as all of uh, these, hmm. you know. You're uh, going to go, go into hip hop. You're going to start to doing some uh, rap music. Or? Not, to, uh, <laughs> but my son do it the rap music beautifully, beautifully, <laughs> writing sure. rhyme and uh, and uh, it's poetry. Every it's poetry. Poetry, yeah. yes. And the recording and the mu music, he's doing it very good. But, uh, not rap music, but, uh, you know, if you go to YouTube, there is a Sohrab number one, two, three, four. That we did it uh, yes. a, a few years ago. Yes, I've seen it, In yes. a church. And then after Mr. Golam Hussein Nami uh, talking about the painting, Sohrab Sepir's painting. Yes, yes. And he was amazing. 
And one of the best things that he, he said that night, the mind of Sorab Seperi when was uh, painting and yeah. uh, drawing uh, whatever the tar, mind was to the empty side, <laughs> not whatever you see. It's interesting. It's really interesting. And this is all about, yet you, you do something and you don't know the, uh, the result. The page work to me again. And I call Reflection, reflection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't know what is coming to, uh, to you when you do something. I mean, you've so beautifully embraced your own journey. Yeah. You know? Do you, do you, are you someone who has any regrets? Never. No regrets? Never. As I told you, I'm happy and I'm sure because I'm thankful. Thankful whatever I am right now. We could learn a lot from you. I'm nothing but if you want. <laughs> but what I'm telling you, to try to say, there is nothing that you can change. There is nothing. But when you accept it, you are open to many other things. Mm. Get from the whatever it comes, or reply to it. Well, what if someone wants to, wants to change the world for better? Yes, the better is uh, whatever you do with yourself and uh, people You're sorry, around. Jackson. You should be kind as you are kind to your own. You should be kind to the other. You should be uh, loving yourself. You are loving yourself. You should love the others as well, without any uh, conditions. Different, mm. black, white, bala, mm. pain, whatever, whatever. It's come and it's around you. It, uh, it needs to be. Look, I'm so grateful for the time today. <laughs> Merci, Vaughan. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you The legendary Soleiman Soli Vasari Soli has been live in the Rook studio with me today. on with Groovy Shy and the fabulous Keon in the Rook studio. I, I could have done that for hours. Yes, that was just, um, that was a wonderful experience speaking to that man. Yes. What a lovely, you know, I've, I've um, met him a number of times and he's, and he's, his energy has always been so wonderful. And so, but all I knew was just like, I know he's a big star. I know some of the old songs and he's a nice man. But it makes sense now. His life philosophy. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a what a positive outlook um, uh, for someone who has lived through the kind of challenges that yes. he's lived with. Um, it's just it, it just incredibly inspiring. Mm -hmm. I found that it's a very calm, down to earth soul, and I loved what he was saying about how everything in life is is <laughs> like there you can't you, sh you, you should just accept it you can't fight it it's supposed to be how it is so um as long as you accept it you can have a that must be part of his sort of spiritual mm -hmm. practice yes, right yes it's just correct yeah in the sufism actually that was one of the main idea like life happened mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it happens yeah. and it's keep happening and actually it slowly gives me hope uh, you know because i also share this kind of philosophical thought with i mean i have this kind of mm. f uh, philosophical ideology and mm -hmm. now that i see him and he's happy you know I, I, I don't know about like his financial status mm -hmm. and what is, but he seems happy, mm -hmm. and that makes me happy. Well, he he's he has no regrets. He said, "Yeah, yeah. that's pretty major. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty major." And and 
the incredible part of this is the sort of the latent toying with uh, um, Persian stereotypes around Persian ideas around status and what's important. I mean, he kind of he he throws all of that in the, into the dustbin, doesn't he? Because he he. he I mean, even just the, the, the driving the taxi part, mm-hmm. you know, I, I harped on it a little bit in the interview. I just thought it was amazing that this 22 years, I couldn't feel sitting across from him just now an ounce of uh, dissatisfaction or frustration or um, uh, shame or, you know, oh, I was this star and then I was driving. If anything, mm-hmm. you know, his his eyes were clear. No, it was a great experience. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot. And so the difference between the delta, between the way the uh, he might be seen from the outside by certain people in our in the Iranian community. Oh, Haif should, you uh, know, yeah. his career got ruined by the revolution. And, you know, but he's got, saying, no, I'm, I'm grateful I've had this journey and mm-hmm. I've learned from it. And I've, I mean, it's just amazing. Like, Special. what a, what a, an amazing way to embrace that. And I would think that he's just, um, you know, making that up or tarofing or doing something, but he made those decisions to not go to L.A. to not mm. be that guy, mm. and you know, and it raises the question: I mean, what what do you think of a life lived without the pursuit of material status? Mm. It's hard when you're Persian, so that's what makes him yeah. so much more special. Yeah, I think. Uh, again, I mean, seeing him happy makes me happy that I, I makes me like mm, continue believing my beliefs mm. you know? yeah what do you think of the um musical journey shia that like listening back to some of that pop stuff from the 60s it's so interesting to hear that before that he's singing the quran and he's <laughs> singing opera because yeah. that that gives a, an insight into the kind of music he's been doing in the last couple of decades it's, right it's not like that came from nowhere yeah. but he's the guy who's doing hamadi feel too you know <laughs> it's such an amazing yeah i mean it, it w- he always i think he always goes with the flow even in a musical journey also i think he wants to go with the flow mm. you know just improvise especially in these days like be free, be free, be free. I think one of the challenges for creative people is is how how much do you follow your creativity passionately and how much do you do what you have to do to make a buck, mm. which is also a reality. I mean, you have to, you know. Yeah. And so, so part of the subtext of his, I mean, he knew he could write these songs for, um, you know, these famous Iranians and he's composing, he's, he's performing. But he he wanted to pursue what was true to him creatively, mm-hmm. uh, and without seemingly a lot of concern for well, what's that? What's you know? How am I going to make the money? And and I don't know how to. Um, I, I certainly don't begrudge people who uh, use their you know harness their creativity to to run a business to make mm-hmm. a you know to to do business. Yeah. I mean that's part of the game too, right? But. Um, what he's done feels so pure and if you didn't see him like sitting uh and improvising over you know, with Rumi you know the other night that I did I wouldn't believe it you know I mean he's the but that he's the real deal that's yeah. what he does that's who he is yeah. even even being a taxi driver is also it means like at some point you go with the flow with each like each most of her, each traveler you go with their direction mm. and there is no direction and this is the point I think there is no direction in life you have to just be alive and enjoy I do feel like um, I don't know how um, how we're supposed to do this but I mean I guess we do it by doing programs like this but I wish more of our community um, embraced him and celebrated mm. him uh, with his more recent records I mean I guess they're not as accessible as pop yeah. hits you yeah, know but course, yeah. all right well you know speaking of the of persian music we had we did an episode about a week and a half ago on the plight of persian music where we had um the artist and uh, academic uh misak moradi who's just released her her debut record she's a an iranian vocalist um on the program talking about 
um, I mean, she was particularly talking about the plight of Persian women singers in Iran under the current laws there. But as the conversation moved along, there was a moment where we she was talking about the standards of Iranian music and Iranian pop uh, and how based on the lack of a, an industry in Iran and the, the dearth of a, a proper music industry, the expectations, the bar of what is considered good by not just by the audience, but by the artists themselves is so much lower than it would be uh, in in the West, say. Mm-hmm. So the quality of what's coming out of Iran is not, is not as good. Um, it, it almost sounded like a controversial thing to be saying, but I know we've got some letters that have you know, almost universally all agree with her. So Keon, tell, mm-hmm. tell us what we've got here. Yeah, so we got a few letters about that specific episode. Um, the first one coming from Afshin Zarai, Zarai, saying, absolutely correct and true, not just about our singers. I think many artists in other fields are the same, and audiences just clap. Yeah, the, the audience do the clapping. That That's a reference to the idea that you know, we go through the motions of, oh, great job, you're mm-hmm. very good, you know, and yeah. but we're not really, uh, you know, um, we don't really think that with, like, with the real deal is a non-Iranian doing yeah. something mm-hmm. uh, more impressive somehow. Um, yeah. And so in, in, in a way, the audiences are enabling it, but with low expectations. What yeah. else you got? Uh, and then another one from Arshia Mardan Lu said, well, First of all, I shall say you can't be more to the point and frank. I absolutely agree with Misar on all the implied points. And yes, she is right in my opinion. The current pop music in Iran is really of poor quality. And about Misar herself, she is a voice artist who, in my opinion, knows Persian and international music very well. She has great singing techniques and skills, and her warm and trained voice is a pleasure to hear. This makes her eligible to criticize Iranian music methodically without any bias. Right. Mm. Yeah. Isn't that the case for uh, like pop music, Western pop music? Uh, what? It, which part of what? That? Like the poor the quality. Yes. I, some of it. I don't think Ed Sheeran is poor quality. I think those are great, great songs. Mm. Yeah, we have like or Beyonce or something. I don't know. I'd say that about rap, like modern today's rap mm-hmm. does not compare to mm. early '90s, like late night. Yeah, that's what I would think of. Um, and then we have Mahlo Moradi said, "Can't agree more with Misal. The current Persian pop music in Iran is not at the same level as global music, since most of the current pop singers in Iran." don't have proper training and academic knowledge in music. Yeah. That's Pretty the, true. If you don't have the the pedigree, if you don't have the, yeah. the industry, how are you supposed to be as good? Uh, so well, thank you for those comments and, and uh, keep them coming in based on Soli or based on any, anything we talk about on the show. Info at rookmedia.com is where to send your letters. Info at rookmedia.com or uh, post on any of our platforms. Thank you, Keon. Thank you, uh, Groovy Shia. Let's get to our next guest. He's about to come into the work studio as well. Our next guest is an Iranian-Canadian professional fitness trainer, wellness coach, and a former European and Canadian champion in karate and bodybuilding. Piruz Varaste is his name, and he happens to also be the son of the late father and founder of karate in Iran, Dr. Fathod Varaste. Peter's migrated to Canada in his late teens in 1986 and has been the recipient of numerous championship titles and awards in karate and kickboxing throughout the years. He's the two-time Canadian champion in karate, a winner of the World Qualifier Canadian Championship, and has been the welterweight champion of Canada. He's also been ranked amongst the top five in Canadian open bodybuilding competitions. And... He is also the older brother, or Dadosh, as we might say, of another Canadian champion, his sister Nassim Varaste, who we are familiar with. And right now, Piruz Varaste joins me live in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Hello there. Very pleasure to be here, Jean. Very nice to have you here. Thank you. You're, you you've been in Canada for almost your entire life, and yet you still talk like an Iruni guy. Uh, yeah, it's because uh, what, what it is is all my life I had Persians. I was surrounded by Persians. I gotta think it's People something tell me like you that. You're a true Persian because even the Persian songs I enjoy. See, and, if and you grew along. up like I did in yeah, a yeah. really, really white, non Persian community, you would talk more, you'd yeah. try and talk more Canadian. But you've well, got the you got the nice little Persian accent. Yeah, you know. yeah. 
I have some, uh, not the not the young street style, no, but no. <laughs> not that deep. Like I got some, no. you know, not unlike my sister because she was Nassim was a lot younger and she lost. Uh, she got she got no Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. No, you don't yeah, have thing. the. I am going to yeah. S Starbucks. I don't have the. S no, you don't have that. But you've got a little bit of something enough to blow it off. Yeah. It's really, <laughs> it's really nice to have you here. I mean, I I feel like we have to. Your family is so impressive that at one point or another we're gonna have to bring every every member of the family no, into it's, the it's, it's the Rook together. Studio. We've, of course, had um, wonderful Nassim here. Um, so it's a pleasure. Thank you for doing this. I know you just completed this 21-day challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching you do it on Instagram. I guess I should have been participating rather than just that watching on Instagram. Been, I but loved to have you. it that looked really cool. inclusive. It looked like people of different shapes and sizes and ages yeah. tell, tell us about what this 21 day challenge is uh, to be uh, completely honest with you the idea came to me uh, in my dream you know and you know there's something they say listen to your inner self and uh, that's how it came along because i really uh, studied and read up about this that it's your intuition and the things that your head starts telling you uh, if you listen to it, uh, it's, it's, it's telling you the right way. It's never wrong and, and go ahead. So it came to my dream and it was like, I did something different last year. I did a 5 a.m. Uh, challenge, which was m mostly for myself because I was going through depression. And, uh, you know, I did it to go and heal in the nature. I mm. figured instead of just start taking medication for this. And I heard that nature, especially when the universe wakes up from 5 to 7 a.m. Mm. So it's got these powers, especially when you're surrounded by trees and the beauty of the nature and the oxygen is just extra fresh. And went out there and just said, okay, let's, let's get out there and do it. And uh, I was just dragging it a little bit, a uh, month and a uh, couple of months. And one morning, uh, all of a sudden at 4 a.m. I woke up sharp. And I go, this must be a sign from God. I gotta do this 5 a.m. Mm. I knew I wasn't planning to record it and and, and you know talk to about, uh, about it to anyone, but pure for my purely for myself. When I went out there, I just soon as like 10, 15 minutes goes by and I start breathing and touching the trees and praying a bit. I'm like, oh my God, I'm just feeling something's going on. And, and it's amazing that the lighting, uh, especially when it's close to summer, uh, changes every yeah. five to ten minutes. Yeah. And the birds start singing, yeah. and it's just like every th every five to ten minutes is different. It gets lighter. The nature is actually speaking with you. Mm -hmm. So I don't like. I, you should never go out with a headset and listen to your music because it's the nature that mm, talks to you. Literally. Yeah. You feel the trees. You walk, and I just felt such an amazing thing. And I had my phone with me. I go, let me just, uh, you know, record a couple of segments uh, of this and see how I'm feeling. And I tell people I went, there was like a pond, there was water running, and I sat down and I did some meditation. You know, I'm very much spiritual, so I did some meditation. Hang there. on a second, two things. One, yeah. be, this table is very, very sensitive. Oh, so okay. don't you keep hitting it. You don't have headphones. Uh, also. Uh, no, I'm just, you're like the Hulk. You know, <laughs> anything you touch, it might break. So <laughs> just be very, yeah, very well, careful with the table because we sure don't bang up your. your no, computer. we just it, we hear it on the microphone. So, so we, oh, okay, uh, okay. But secondly, you know, I I used to. Uh, it's just as you're talking about it, I'm getting, I'm I'm mad at myself because for a few years, for many years, I was running and I would get up super early in the morning and run. Mm -hmm. And now I've changed my routine where I still get up early, but I do some work stuff and, and then I do, go to the gym later in the day. Yeah. But you're right. There is something about 5 a.m., so, 6 a.m. Yeah, oh yeah, you sure. finish your workout or even you finish your just uh, you exercise have, activity and it's right. still just 7 a.m. Yeah, you have yeah. so many hours in yeah. the day. Exactly. And but and I it mean, is a the, magical the, the hour. Energy, yeah, There's it's a magical hour because the energy and the air is so fresh because you think about it today, if you went out at two in the afternoon or we were speaking right now even two hours ago, you would get exhausted. Humidity is up, right, the sun is at right. opening. There, like I said, you really see, especially five to six, even this year when I did. So anyways, make the long story short for the 5 a.m. That was more healing and ended up helping a lot of people. They healed from it. They would message me. Oh my God, there was a guy from Iran and said that his doctors told him he's, uh, he's, he was under... COVID and a uh, uh, bad situation, they told him he has to go through like about a year of therapy to heal. And then he ended up going to a park and started doing karate techniques and stuff. And you were just uh, on Instagram just telling, telling people to go. This whole time, every day I'm live with these people. I so see, he right, said, right. I went after five weeks and I did this and I can't believe I'm throwing karate. It was a the karate practice. Can I tell you a secret? Karate -ka. One of the reasons I've wanted to have you on this show for a while, mm -hmm. it's not just that you were a champion karate guy and the, the, your, the amazing legacy of your father, etc. 
uh, about a year ago or about a year and a half ago, I, I had at least five different people tell me, this right. guy is really inspiring me. They, they mm. were talking about this, this yes. 5 a.m. thing that exactly. you were doing. This was the five. Yeah. yeah. So the 21 day challenge just came to me. My dream, the, the 50 was completed last summer. I was thinking of doing something like that. And this intuition came to me in my dream. And I thought, you know what, what a good way because not everybody's like super athletic and especially Persian to attack that community because you know, Persian people, like I would say, they're pa- Varzish Dust, not Varzish Kar, <laughs> right? So, we, we love yeah, they Varzish Dust, let me translate that. Things, we, but, cheer, yeah. we like cheering uh, athleticism, exactly, but we don't yeah. do it. So I'm like, you guys, uh, and they're un- ready to go under the knife, have any kind of crazy surgery <laughs> done to them, and do the most dramatic diet of like killing themselves literally for three weeks to get ready right. for a party or an event. But little they put this idea in their head that actually exercising makes you healthy. First of all, number one, right. what happens to health if they cut you over and take something out and put something in? You, you don't really become find healthy. that's a thing with Persians. Uh, I really, uh, I mean, feel you would they're know. Ex- they're I mean, extreme people, Persians, because mostly a lot of my most of my clients are Persians right, and right. Uh, other than Persians as well. But Persians are extreme people. Persians are tambal, right? lazy, <laughs> lazy, exactly. So we you know, would rather go, rather pay the surgery for the yeah, fifty thousand like dollar. Like, they like rather short term <laughs> stuff and effective, <laughs> and terrible. just get rid. Of, I'm like, guys, you have to just feel good coming out of the shower the way you came to this of earth. Course, you go yeah. look in the mirror, and if you go by that and keep your weight within five pounds of your worst to your best, you're always gonna stay in shape. Right. So with so, so, this so, twenty one yeah, days, 20 I figured, yeah. let me do something that no one has excuses. I said, I'm gonna do this. Uh, this is my purpose in life to do good in this world. Uh, I'm not there just to make money for myself. This is how I'm going to do something. And I didn't know who's going to show up. Well, I told my boot camp members, so I knew seven or eight of them. They told me to come, but if no one even showed up, I would have done it. So I went and I was surprised on my first day, June 1st, it started. And oh my God, 15, 20 people are there that I don't know. And I started saying, wow, like people, if you're those who cannot join us, Create a little group like this with uh-huh. your close friends anywhere you are, Iran. And you're just foreign. walking. What you're are you doing? You're just walking. You're just walking. But it ended up people, uh, they got so hyper and stuff from me because <laughs> I'm a hyper person. So they're like, can we do a little running? I go, okay, let's try to do a little running, but we want to keep the group thing together. Run, but come back to us. Let me ask you something yeah. else too, though. And this is put put on your wellness coach, uh, your professional trainer hat here. If let's say I'm somebody who does generally doesn't get enough sleep. Mm-hmm. Because I, I, I'll bet there's a bunch of people thinking this out there. Right. Let's say I, I'm I'm generally sleep de- deprived. If I go to bed at two in the morning, mm. I don't want to, but I, it's been a long day and I had to do some work late at night or something, and so right. I'm going to go to bed at two a.m. Yeah. Uh, and I have the opportunity to sleep until seven thirty mm-hmm. uh, before I go to work, for example, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or I could get up. At 5 a.m. and do the and and, and go outside, mm. which will mean I'm only going to get three hours of sleep. Right, right. Which do you recommend? Okay, so here's the thing that uh, I didn't mention about this, but now you reminded me of it. So part of this 21 day challenge, there's like actually something called 21 day fix. If people read up about it on the internet, is to step out of your comfort zone. Right. Okay. So it's stepping out of your combat. They say every um, you know thing that you want change in your life. If you want to get rid of a bad habit and introduce a new habit to it, uh, you know, step out of your comfort zone. Do that. So the idea behind this is actually myself. I'm not an early sleeper. Most Persians we don't like to go to bed at <laughs> right. at ten thirty, right. eleven o'clock. So far, we Persians are, are lazy and they yeah. go to bed at three. We in the are. Morning. You know, yeah. we used to be Zoroastrians. <laughs> fire people up. Okay. You know yeah, this. So it's yeah, you, it's <laughs> part of this is actually regulates you. Who are these Persians push, you're running around with? I, there are Persians that go to bed at 10 p.m. But that, <laughs> rarely, come on. <laughs> How many, you know, Persians that I talk to, most of them is like the 12 o'clock right. the earliest. The, the tw- you know? 12 o'clock, they're starting the cab off. Yeah, exactly. Then, yeah, they okay. eat dinner at uh, <laughs> at 10 o'clock, which I tell them not to. I go, your lightest meal should be at Okay, at so yes. So it's to organize your life, so you discipline your life, and you make sure that you do, I mean, okay, generally, if I'm not doing any of uh, in 6 a.m. or 5 a.m., I get up early in the morning to around 6.30, 7 to go out with my dog, we go, we go mm-hmm. hiking, right? So I try to be in bed during the week, at least Monday to Friday by, by midnight. 
the latest. Okay, so you get about so six hours. Six hours, and, uh, and during the lunch time, when I come home for lunch, I get like a siesta, like a oh, nap, okay. because in Europe, in Iran, it's even famous to do, and that's really like a boost. Uh, like me, if I get five, six hours of sleep, and I get half an hour of uh, nap after mm -hmm. my lunch, I feel better than if I were to get a straight. I've never been able. To, I've never been able to do the yeah, nap, the, people, the, yeah, the nap yeah, thing. I, I, if, if I do a nap, mm -hmm. I find that I wait. I, then I'm exhausted afterwards. But, but depends, my body how, thinks I didn't get enough how sleep. How long? How long do you nap if you do nap? A, two hours. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> no. Thing. No. I know. No. I'm joking. I know <laughs> yeah. you're supposed to do yeah. like a twenty minute nap. Yeah, but twenty minutes. I've never, to been, half I've never an been able to master that. Yeah, and it's like a, it's a boost. You just your your body's exhausted. You actually fall asleep faster than you know. Like I put on a meditation tape that's supposed to be like a healing meditation to calm you down and you know within five minutes i'm out so peters let, let me let me ask you about your your story i mean it it's um it's quite amazing how early this started for you your athleticism and your abilities uh but it's impossible to talk about your story without talking about your dad so if, i hope it's okay if i can ask oh, a couple of questions about him 100%. your dad farhad varaste uh was a martial arts grandmaster he, he was the father and founder of of karate in iran um for, for those listening who don't know his story because so many folks do but for those who don't Tell, tell us what he was like as a person. Uh, as a person, um, he was, the, he could be the kindest father, and at the same time, he could be the strictest. And uh, in short term, he put me at like such a young age, I was two and a half years old. As a matter of fact, I, we go back, there was a time apparently that my grandparents used to tell me this story that I was in diapers and he would stretch my legs <laughs> right. and that was his toy and uh, he's having fights with my grandparents all the time because they're gonna you're gonna this is not a is like it's a barbie a doll <laughs> you know it's gonna you're gonna pop his leg and it's like you guys don't know what what you're talking about you're gonna see what's gonna he's gonna be a champion and and so on and so he was he was a great father and um, you know he would buy me the best of toys and you know i had a motorcycle when i was like six years old a mini honda he got me but when it came to not doing what he asked you to do, you bought you a motorcycle when you were six years old. Yeah, six. That doesn't sound very old, practical. Mini Honda, I could barely <laughs> like get on the thing <laughs> right. and ride it. Right. So okay. it you started early. Get, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but uh, we used to have an ambuddy place, so uh -huh. you know, like a storage room. Right. And as soon as you did something that he didn't want, your grades were low or uh, didn't come to karate classes and anything like this, he had the, uh, that was the best way. Actually, I think that you can teach discipline to your. To your kids tough, because, tough love. Yeah, because you know it's not by beating them or being overly nice to them. He would give all the gifts, but as soon as you didn't do what he asked you to do, this you would lose all your privileges, and all these things would go to the storage room to that amber, and he had the key for two weeks. Mm. So you would lose that for two weeks, and if day ten you messed up again, the two weeks would extend from that, <laughs> right? Right. So uh, he was- No, no more mo motorcycle that you shouldn't be riding at the age of six well, anyway. Well, I mean, right. I would ride it in the backyard of the house. It was a <laughs> nice, beautiful bungalow right. we had, and the backyard was large enough to- How did about. he, I, I know yeah. he famously sort of brought karate to Iran. Mm -hmm. How did he find karate? Well, to be honest with you, uh, we go back to my, uh, it's the strangest situation because my grandfather was, uh, language of professors he was a genius in languages mm. and he knew 46 languages of of the world and he would translate everything that would come for to Shah Iran. he was in charge of Shah Iran's personal library yeah so he had like nothing to do with karate he was like this and so he sent my father to to school he was in England and um, while he was in England he got into a fight with a with a boxer and the boxer like punched him in the face and uh, my father was disturbed because he lost a fight and then he got he, he wanted to beat this guy so he went out there and found out things and oh there's such thing as karate so he picked up learning karate in england as he was going to high school and, uh, and then the, he was later got transferred to geneva he was going to university of geneva and he was studying political science mm. So while he was there, he started going, uh, he loved, had so much passion for karate that he started traveling and going to Japan in the summertime. And his master's name was Kori Hizataka. He was a like 10th degree black belt, one of the best in uh, uh, you know, karate in Japan. And so he would take 
lessons from him and come back to school without my grandfather knowing, without his <laughs> knowledge. He would just use his pocket money, the money that was sent to him for, you know, study. So, uh, you know, my grandfather by surprise went and visited him once and he, then he found out about this, that my father's not there. And in Geneva? Uh, or yeah, where, yeah, yeah, that's when he was in Geneva. And then he just had to tell him what, what's going on. But his grades were up and he was doing great in school. So mm -hmm. as my grandfather, as long as he was doing great there, no problem. Your studies, your marks are high, then you can do what you want. Anyways, he did both. He got his master's in political science and also he got his master's in, uh, he went to um, the States and from University of Texas, he also got his master's wow. in university. Yeah in the political science same time karate was always in his life and then at that point after he traveled to iran and uh, he decided that he wants to introduce this to his country of birth and that's when the shah of iran was there there was no martial arts of any kind so he had to go through his all these different challenges of going to try to prove that uh, that you can actually this fight with bare hand because yeah. karate actually means bare, uh, empty hand uh -huh. The meaning of karate translated, empty hand. So it uh, had to prove that you can actually fight with soldiers and uh, disarm them with, you know, bare hands. And mm. the way he learned karate back in his day was like karate combat. Like it was street, st uh, strictly like self-defense. Mm -hmm. They would uh, wear wooden armor suits and literally kick each other in the groin area and break the wooden path off mm -hmm. here. Everything that now it's in the world of sports karate is illegal. Back then was legal. How did he get? Uh, I mean, I say this with respect, but how did he get so well known? I, I'll meet mm -hmm. Iranians now of a certain vintage, if they're old enough, especially mm -hmm. uh, who you say the name Farhad Varista. They they know they mm -hmm. know who he is. They know who he was. Right. Uh, it occurs to me that in a place like Canada or the United States, we don't necessarily, unless you're in the field, we don't know the names of karate champions. Or oh, yeah, exactly. uh, why, why was why did he become such an icon in Iran? Well, I'll be honest with you. In Iran, uh, like I said, when he brought the sport, um, he got Shah of Iran's attention because he did some seminars for the army. So mm. he first had to open up all these doors to get there. Then once he got there, then he got into Shavran and he did a demonstration for Garda Shahan Shahi up in the mountains. And this is where the, um, the Shah of Iran got actually impressed by him because he started breaking some bricks mm. and fighting against some of the soldiers that would attack him with the machine guns and it had the knife in front. Okay, and he would show them how he can defend from this and Shah was very impressed. And then he broke some bricks and there's a picture uh, that um, uh, the Shah himself Iran. was there. The Shah himself. Wow. Well, of course, okay. with the guard of the guard, the Shah and Shah. Actually, right, have the actual right, picture yeah. there. And he had his marble table. He's sitting behind it. So there's a picture that he goes and looks at my father's hand. He looked his hand very much like mine. Mine is cut here, but he had a bigger hump here from breaking like bricks and so on. So uh, Shah is looking at his hand and he tells him, uh, "Mr. Warsa, how long does it take to?" Uh, be able to break these bricks like three months or something and my father got sort of insulted because it really takes a lot longer right. to be able to break a brick especially uh, those crazy right, bricks right. in Iran they've been cooked in some whatever temperature so he's like um, your Allah has that what is it that you think your highness that uh, a human being cannot break so he's looking around and there in the mountains this is a true story and he's like well there's really nothing here. We're in the mountains. This old that you guys brought. And he's like, what about if I broke your marble table that you're sitting on? And there's this huge marble table. And he's like, well, how are you going to break this? It's quite an audacious thing to say to the show. Uh, that, uh, well, because... Well, I, I'm going to break your table. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, Shaw could afford it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> anyway, so it took 14 uh, of his bodyguards. And, and he used to train Shah of Iran's bodyguards already at uh -huh. that time. Guard the Shah and Shahi, uh -huh. right? So they held up this table, uh, picked up the table, held it straight for my father to, to do a punch in the middle of it. And it was, he punched shot and, and broke, broke the table. open to pieces. Uh, shot it. And then there's the picture afterwards that And so, and like, people find out about this? Uh, the, uh, well, I mean, the the people that had to find out about it because, you know, the Shah of Iran and the, the already the, the guard, the Shah and Shah, then of course that spread like crazy. Right. So he started getting the rights of being able to teach this first only to uh, 
uh, you know, maybe the army and so on, and then he got the permission. It's such a scene to, out of a movie. Yeah, yeah. It, it was I'll, I'll, break, I'll break your yeah, marble table. And exactly. The king so says, he no, went you can't do that. Talk about then. trying to impress someone, but the, you know, the hardest <laughs> right, way. Right. So after that, he, they just got introduced others, and these other doors opened, and they allowed him to teach it and to open up uh, the academy and first two, three different places in Iran. And uh, then in 1977, he created a team that in men's team within a short period of time, they became third in the world. And, mm, you know, yes. like they faced like teams like, you know, the Japan, United States, so on. 1977, Iran team became all of a sudden third in the world, which is crazy. Like, what did you think of your dad's fame or, or I mean, were you aware of it at that point? Yeah, I was, I was aware of it. I, I was actually the little guy always uh, been taken to the acad academy, we called it. Uh, in Iran, and I was the guinea pig of my father's students. They always used to say, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, so we, you would we be can the pick one on your dad, but we can kick your butt. And they'll be like literally kicking me and making me a, become a poster, kicking me and sending me to the wall. That, I mean, that made me who I am actually, but at the time I used to hate it. Like many nights I went home like with tears in my eyes and so on. Well, let, let me um, ask you about that because mm -hmm. uh, f first of all, you, you got your black belt by the age of eight, right? Yes, I was about roughly Which eight, is insane. Years old, yeah. I mean, that's a, uh, is that, that's not normal, right? Well, I mean, junior black belt you can become. Well, later on, as people started taking the martial arts younger and younger, it became more normal. So you would become a junior black belt, and then then you would go and again as you become an adult, mm. uh, retake it. I think by the age of eight, I had a white belt, and I don't think it ever changed color. No. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> you were irregular. Right? <laughs> no, no, I yeah. I think I, just, no, I quit you're, before. Uh, I didn't have you as a trainer. Yeah, I, I, if you're I, extremely, uh, but that's that's the thing with karate is like no matter God can be your trainer you can come it, it takes a certain discipline if you you don't have that fighting spirit i mean everything is nice you're learning techniques and then the minute you receive that first kick in the head <laughs> yeah. or punch in the that's face, pretty much yeah. people that at that time they just no, it's not for me well i was pretty i was yeah. pretty good at soccer so and football so i was like yeah. i'll just stick with i'll stay in my lane right, right. this stuff i'm getting beaten mm. up and i can't i can't handle it mm -hmm. uh did you so you're you're, you're black belt at the age of eight You've said, I've heard you say before that there was pretty much um, being your dad's son. I mean, it was almost impossible to assume that you were going to be anything other than an athlete. Uh, yeah. do, do you feel like you ever had a choice or do, do you feel like this was inevitable that you had to be, you would go into this field and that you would become a champion? Um yeah, I really, it, it was in my blood because I, I truly believe that it's your, your genes have a lot to say in this, in what you're asking me. If I were like, I had two cousins that basically are identical twins and one of them was exactly like me into sports, went to anything he wanted, he became a champion and his identical twin is an artist, completely never did a day of sport in your life, even though the same parents, mm. right? So you have to have it in your blood, but yeah, it definitely was from the push of the parent, my father. And uh, many times I actually was turned off of karate because I was getting beat up so many times by these big guys and stuff. And, and uh, you know, once my father just uh, looked at me, I'm like, I, I turned to him, I said, what are you doing this to me? And my grandfather actually used to have my back towards this. Like, mm -hmm. why you wanna turn this kid into, uh, you're putting him through torture, you know, having beat up, uh, coming home crying. And uh, he just said, one day he will know, right? Then when we traveled to France, you know, the, I was only like 16 after years old. After the revolution. Yeah, after the revolution. And so we, we actually, they knew my father, Jacques Delcourt, was um, the French president of karate. Just from knowing my father, he agreed that we would represent Iran from exile and travel from France to Italy and compete in European championships. Yeah. And at that time, I was only 16 years old. And you competed so for your own. Old, I competed uh, in that and uh, ended up, instead of like one gold medal, I got two gold medals in, in, in Kumite, which is fighting, and Kata, which is form. But hang on a second, Piers. Mm. Go back a couple of steps. This idea of you coming home crying um, and how hard this was for you, I feel like today that would be an issue yeah. i feel like somebody would i don't know intervene or say mm. you're being too hard on this kid or call child services or something uh, like that probably um everything has changed since but i don't do you do you do you, do you, do you think your dad was right i mean do you think that 
Um, because obviously you've turned out to be you. Be but. honest with you, I think he was right, but things were different. I, I, I don't think we can compare it. Valid. Uh, my father, like he didn't want me to be bachelor loose and uh, and all that. It's like you know, I'm. I had to represent, and he had high expectations on me. But like it's I a said lot of pressure. earlier, that's a lot of pressure. I had a lot of pressure that way. But he would never raise a hand and beat me up, and so mm. that the other way we talked about, he would put my belongings into that storage room right. so in as a father he was amazing to me can i ask you why there's so many um tragic stories heartbreaking stories around the revolution and people who had to leave people who were exiled mm -hmm. people who had to flee people who were unwittingly um needing to leave their belongings and get out what happened with your i mean on the face of it he's an athlete your dad mm -hmm. he's not a political figure uh, why did he end up having to leave Iran? Well, to uh, be honest with you, uh, he was a combination. He was a bit of a threat because uh, to them, first of all, anybody that could create big numbers, large numbers of people to go out there, there was a threat right. to them. And right. they already knew my father had so many followers. students and right. followers and in all different areas of Iran, you know, they would have students and practitioners. And if he was to get out there and just say, all you guys come out, it was a threat to the, to the obviously to the government. And, but the other thing is they actually came and offered him that, uh, you know, just come and train the, you know, the army and let go of your students and he disagreed with that. the new army the, the, the new army. Islamic, yeah, republic. The Islamic republic army so he disagreed with that so once he disagreed with that they they bothered him many times uh, he went to prison and uh, they took him they would come to our house I remember I was a kid you know like 3 a.m. break break the windows throw you know the tear gas inside and we're like kids and arrest my father and take him why in. were they arresting him uh, they would arrest him and they just exactly like uh, work with us and he would disagree and it's like I would work with you guys too but I can't let go of all this generation of students and all this and uh, you know karate schools that I have across the country and, and, and whatnot, was your so. was it was it, it was an issue fixed. with your grandfather because your grandfather was directly um, working with the the, the Pat Levy regime was that well part of the problem or in terms of uh, not problem but it was that why why well, the regime was having an issue exactly well in a way it was because I mean they used to call uh, literally call us you guys are talk with these you know you guys are from that and your grandfather was this you right, know like right. you know, this and you guys go way back from that and this no matter what even when i remember the last years of school uh they would tell me this that you know your you guys uh, your name is this and as soon as it doesn't mix you can't say that you know you're with mm. this regime and i'm like well we're adopting uh and so on so but they didn't really have anything on him to to execute him but th they had enough on him that actually a couple of times they they took your grandfather to or your no, father? my father they your took father. him to uh you know where they execute and they executed the couple of people beside him and wow. they were blindfolded and then they didn't kill him they said it's not your time so they he went through a lot of mental stress so that's why when finally uh you know he happened to be lucky to have enough students around that one of them went over there and he had his go at the um, comité and he got him out and uh, this time when he came out and he's like, you guys better try to uh, flee the country. And so we fled, we went through Turkey and- uh, On foot, uh, literally uh, flee. Literally, right? well, it wasn't exactly, well, a lot of areas was on foot, but uh, my father paid someone. We we're supposed to be on these horse, magic horses, yeah. and three hours later be on the other side of the uh, Turkish border. And then from there, we were guaranteed we're gonna be on a plane, um, you know, then to the States. But this was going on right at the time that, um, you know, the hostages from U.S. that was going, uh, taking place. Yeah. So we, we got held back in Istanbul for four months, and my father was just spending money in hotels and whatnot. And after four months, they rejected to give us visa. And that's how we ended up going to, to Paris, France, because from this point, uh, my father, he just knew the French Federation the president. Jacques Delcourt, and he said, just send a telegram at the time to him. Mm. We didn't have the email system now. I mean, I've, I've asked and, uh, Nassim boom, the next day. Uh, yeah. Your sister about this, but she, of course, was a uh, just a few months old. Yeah, she was only uh, when we left Iran. She was like six, seven months. Little old, baby, little yeah. Baby. So, but you weren't. You weren't. You no. were cognizant. You were in your early teens or yes, mid teens. Yes. So I was probably twelve, around twelve. Well, how 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 does that period where 
they're breaking your windows and arresting your dad. How, how does that affect you for the rest yeah. of your life? To be honest with you, it was, it was really um, hard to take, you know, but uh, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. It built a lot of character for us, you know, with the things that we saw in our childhood and then, you know, just going and not knowing all of a sudden, you know, we're, we escaped the country at that time was good enough. We're safe. We're just, you know, we learn to be grateful all the time. You know I mean? At this point, we're alive. We left the country. Okay, we don't go to the States, but we're in France. It's a civilized country. We ended up like from not speaking a word of French, going directly to school. So now I speak French. So I take that as a blessing as well. You weren't so, angry at having. Um, to, were, were you uh, were you an a- angry as a kid? No, why why did this happen? Why do I have to leave you? No, why do I, I don't. I just my own personality. I, I I just never. I was never. I never felt that way. Angry, but to answer that question is like even now like. There's not a second in my life that I regret because there's friends that I have, there's things that I've done right now that it was all the cause of all these other things that happened. Even if it meant like losing my country. I do miss my country. I'm in touch with a lot of people. We have heart to hearts messaging each other on Instagram. The things that I do nowadays and it affects a lot of hearts, it affects a lot of people. I try to help them in whatever way I can, but um, you know, you're you're there. You know, you just don't want to change anything. You know? By the time you come to Canada, I'm going to ask you about being a champion, a Canadian champion, in a moment. Mm-hmm. But but uh, did you did you always feel welcome uh, in the Canadian martial arts community, or uh, or was it difficult at first? I mean, I'm thinking you come here in the '80s. Yeah. It's a little bit of a different attitude towards Iranians than than today. Yeah, that's but, actually a yeah, good question because in Canadian martial arts. We actually, my father's first dojo, which is uh, the karate training hall, was in a small little basement of 1,500 square feet in Lawrence and Pharmacy area. And um, that's where he built this uh, like major champions who became our fourth, fifth generation of uh, fighters, which my sister Nassim happened to be one of them because she was one of the little ones. And so all these people, they were all around the uh, ages. So, um, they were from six, seven years old, some of them five, six years old. We had five, six year old to seven, eight year olds at the time. Nassim was around that so eight, nine and coming. So we created like a, you know, a bunch of like mini uh, ninjas. Okay. <laughs> right. And part of the reason Nassim became so amazing is because all her fighting partners were guys. Right. right. So at first uh, it was a business. My father wanted to just have a karate school just for survival. But then when we had enough numbers, he's like, OK, why don't we start competing here? We entered the first Karate Ontario competition and we had pretty much everybody in each uh, weight class. And myself was competing at the time, too. Then we had some higher black belts, older, every age group. First Ontario championships, 77 clubs competing. We ended up getting first, second, third place. First, second, third place of every class. Wow. From the little guys all the way to us. And then these guys are like, oh, some weird guy. I mean, karate was not anything that, that they hadn't seen. Like, they would tell us, you guys came from the movies. You guys are ninjas. Right, like, right, you're just right. amazing. This, Cobra this, Kai. This, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It was up yeah, beyond that. Like, it was just, oh. we outclassed. We just... We would fall with each other to get first, second, and third. So two, three, long story short, two, three tournaments like this we went, and these guys are like, oh my God, like they're killing us, you know? So they had to find reasons, like one of our spectators that was screaming too loud for his kid competing, clapping, like reasons, crazy reasons oh, like wow. this, to ban us from competition for two years. So that just made us stronger. We came, we trained harder. After two years, we went, same thing, repeated the same thing, same thing. And ended up, you know, the top three of Ontario championships, they get chosen to go to Canadian championships to compete for Canada's. Mm. So when you go to Canada's, then the top three, then we went to Canada and we did in Canadian champion, we did the same thing. Mm. Again, we got A, A, B, C rated. So we got all the Canada's (laughs) same way. We're playing of uh, fighters again from 77 dojos. Most of the Canadian championships uh, champions were from our club and my sister Nassim including, and I was still competing at the time. So we all got like gold medals in our next coming What back. was it like for you? Um, it's kind of the million dollar question. I mean, uh, you end up coming to Canada and becoming a champion for Canada, wearing the Canadian flag. You're a kid who grew, grew up in Iran. Right, you competed right, right. for Iran. Even when you're in France, you competed with the Iranian flag. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
What yeah. What was it like being a becoming a Canadian champion? You know, to um, be honest with you, I just appreciated that Canada let us in and uh, we felt, not that I would say right away we felt Canadian, but uh, the opportunity to come or to go over there. I mean, if they would ask me, uh, even though I was a Canadian citizen, if they asked me if you're Canadian, I would say I'm a Persian Canadian, you know, and I still say it because I'm not uh, ashamed of where I come from. But Canada gave us comfort. They got, we got the opportunity to do and I felt just as proud being on the podium with the Canadian uh, flag. And then I got the opportunity to go international. Uh, the time that I became a Canadian champion, I was involved in, the, in an attack. Many people attacked me on the downtown Toronto. I don't know if you heard of that. With yeah. Machetes I, and knives and I wasn't my fingers. I wasn't sure like if I was bring, bring that up. Is that a, I mean, what do no, you... No, uh, no, no. The reason is I'm talking about it is because when I became a Canadian champion, this has already happened before. They, so what, they what were attacking my the, head and I the, blocked A bunch it. of guys uh, jumped you? Or no, what, there was what? a gang of uh, people, but uh, it's not like they knew me. And this gang, they were from uh, from Buffalo, hmm. right? So at the time, three, four guys jumped a friend of mine and I went to help him out. And as I put these guys off of them, one of them screamed, is this, you know, this son of a gun, whatever knows martial arts. Next thing you know, there's 15, 20 people coming with chains and the, the wow. you know, yeah, they had these big like machetes and stuff and i just thought there's a like a, a wooden thing i know there's a shiny thing it was like a metal bar coming to my head and i just as a reflex put my arm up to block the metal and it was a machete so it went all the way to the bone and the, it cut a nerve here like this the blood was just shooting out it was ridiculous like on these people's face and people were panicking it was like july 12th in the summertime and people are just, uh, nobody's helping. Like, they're just scared. They're sitting in their car. So for a minute and a half, they're attacked. Like, if they would have got me how, down how for a second. How old were you when this happened? This, this is uh, 1990, so if we go back. Your 20s and your 20s. Yeah, exactly, my 20s. And my, yeah, mid-20s later. So the reason I brought this up is six months after that, I was supposed to go a year and a half to therapy. The therapy got short in six months, and they told me, Pierce, you can move your hands, whatever. And then uh, another six months after that, I entered and won the Canadian Championships That's for the amazing, first time. Man. Which That's the right. doctors told me you'll never make a fist. So this is uh, up here, I never gave Mark advice. Messier winning the, the the Stanley Cup on a broken leg. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So you know, when you don't accept it up there in your mind, and it's like that's my love, that's my passion. Don't tell me I can't do it. So, but then when I repeatedly broke my finger here. This gave me the now, idea. Now, now I'm obsessed with looking at your finger. It's yeah, kind of mangled that finger. Yeah, this this is. Um, well, well, it, all the it, way. It's I got two screws in here, and I got two screws in that one. Wow. So they told me if you go back to competition, break it one more time, it would be ridiculous. It would just stick out like this, and we'll make a fist. And that's where the idea of competing in bodybuilding t uh, came to mind. I was going to ask you about bodybuilding. Exactly. Why, why did you go? Because you're a champion in karate and mm. kick, kickboxing as well, I should mention. Yeah, but then you go into bodybuilding. Yeah. I didn't even know that bodybuilding and karate, now that I've researched yeah. you, I, I know you've talked Not about the fact do. that they actually go together in some ways, but I, I thought that they would be the opposite. Like, yeah. what, you know, but, but why did you want to go into bodybuilding? So one thing that whenever I won karate championships, and this I haven't, many, I haven't really shared this with people before, maybe I have in one or two interviews, is because no matter what I won, people told me, well, big deal, your father is Mr. Shinan Farhad Varasta, so it's only normal for you to win. Uh, karate championships. I never felt like I got credited for it. It's like, but huh. it's still my sweat and blood. You know, I'm right. going there competing. I never got that credit that I wanted. And I'm like, that was one That's reason. That's the I curse like, of being uh, the yeah. progeny of a famous exactly. person. So right? that was one reason. I, um, I just wanted to become a champion in something else. And then bodybuilding was around there. I always did weight training on the side. And my father always introduced weight training, even from Iran when he had his academy, he would tell people weight train. At the time that people didn't believe weight training mm. was good for you because back in the days, if you if you look at basketball players in the 70s, they're all very slim type people. You sure. Know? Karim yeah. Abdul-Jabbar's time. Yeah. Look at them, they're all slim and tall. Look at the uh, basketball players now. They're all like muscular because they got right. proven that you can have muscle, you can actually function better and, and you will not get injured as easily. 
right? right? So it got proven in in that sense. So my father from back then he had that belief that weight training is good for you. So and we did weight training on the side to our power and our techniques. And your father and wasn't whatnot. a small guy. He was pretty no, broad. No, no, no. He was built. Yeah, he has yeah, a yeah. demonstration that they're breaking stuff on yeah. him, and that's where I got. He it from broke the I marble table. I know. And yeah, he yeah. did <laughs> that, and he was a powerful guy. But he wasn't a bodybuilder. He did weight training on the side. And uh, you know, ju- and he did it for the image of it, for the look of it, and to have the power. Let me, while I'm asking you why you love bodybuilding, let me ask you just a, in general about martial arts. So, what, mm. I mean, you, it's it's you, you've lived it. Your family lives it. It's part of who you are. Mm. If somebody were to be new to it, or were thinking about enrolling their kids in it, or were thinking about taking up karate, or mm. a woman, a man, whomever who's out there. Why do you love martial arts, or why would you recommend it? Uh, martial arts is a way of life. Okay, it's not just coming and learning punching and kicking. You know what you learn, and specifically in karate, because karate is very disciplined. And uh, my father used to say, karate is a miniature version of life. It teaches you when a door shuts on you, you don't back up. You open up another door hmm. and you go in. Right? I wouldn't be the person who I am today. You know humble and uh, you know it makes you humble it makes you down to earth uh it makes you like the best athletes in the world they're like uh, they're not cocky people you know mm. if you you know you're you know what you can do you don't need to prove it the mm. best people on the planet they don't go talk highly about themselves other people talk highly about them so your your sister nasim we I, I have to ask you a little bit about her because she's a multiple champion as well mm-hmm. Um, she's younger than you. I know you played a mentoring role in her life. Were you guys, uh, especially when you were younger, were you competitive? I mean, would, well, uh, would it a, piss you off that she does so well? Or, or Not at all. I'm proud of her. I always brought her when, and when I created my boot camp. Actually, I would bring my sister in as the guest of honor many times and introduce her. I'm super proud of her. She's uh, the most accomplished athlete in the uh, world of karate in Canada. Not only that, the first Canadian coach ever. Uh, for men and women, uh, I've always been proud. There's no such thing because I was actually uh, part of, I, I look at it, I was part of the reason that she is who she is because me and my father, with that age difference of 15 years, my father wouldn't spar with all these generations. I'm the one who would kick them around. And, uh, you know, Nassim was just one of them. I mean, mm. maybe, you know, uh, I made her cry a few times, but then I was coaching her. There's pictures in Can- Karate Canada that I'm there warming up her legs, getting her ready for competition. So, you know, if we were like, uh, the, I mean, there should be no jealousy among siblings, but uh, I just think that if we were closer in age or if it was a guy to guy, maybe it would be more of, a, uh, more of that, what you're talking about. But uh, no, there's nothing but... Uh, but love and I'm, I'm proud and just a proud older brother and glad that in my way that I could contribute and during the tough times that she became who she she is and then she went and uh, you know got more accomplished and went more into uh, you know traveling and and uh, making herself so well, you guys but, are quite a quite a duo. But uh, uh, quite a. You saw when you came to Dojo, all of a sudden, boom, we blend. Let's hold mid. Yeah, let's go yeah, back. That's yeah. kind of how we used to be back yeah, then. You know yeah, what I mean? So it's really you. So, you have yeah. an, you have your own language physically with each other too. Oh, yeah, of Watching you two together, yeah, it's just it's a little a, eye contact. Boom, boom. We're gonna yeah. do this. We're gonna put on a show. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that's she's always my little sister. But I mean, I'm proud of her, and she's done great for Karate Canada, and she's broken the records of a woman, woman power kind of a thing, let's say. Piers, it's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here. I really have appreciated our talk. I wanna, before I let you go, ask you just a couple more questions about your dad, mm-hmm. because um, you, you posted a, um, a video on New Year's Day um, which was your late father's birthday, right? His birthday was uh, yeah, New it was Year's uh, Day, yeah, January first. Yeah, yeah, December thirtieth. December thirtieth. Uh, between that and January. 1st. You 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 posted um, this video of him doing moves and mm-hmm. and then you kind of following those moves. Yes, and, exactly. that's um, what I did. That five a.m. The, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, that was full the same circle. One. We're he back. Did to... in nineteen seventy-seven, and I did that ah. after him. Well, I, that's it's a beautiful I post that I encourage yeah. people like they can go see it on. But what what I thought was interesting was that you hashtagged best friend. Yes. 
because we so, were best friends, actually. He, uh, well, tell me about that. I mean, yeah. he was obviously your mentor. He was your father. Yeah. Tell me about the best friend part. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, wow, you're a very detailed person. Nice, nice of you to notice this because many people, they don't notice that. My father, we... Uh, I mean, besides the world of karate that he was super strict with me, but we would go hunting together. We would go and talk about anything. I was, I had a very open relationship. I was never afraid to talk about women to him and he would talk to me about uh, all of that. And, uh, you know, we were super close, uh, proper, but very close. And uh, we spent like, you know, in Iran Fridays was the holiday. So we'd do barbecues together and, you know, go to Shomal together. We had so many memories, and again in France, and so it wasn't just a relationship of karate and all that. So the fact that I was just, you know, like many people can't talk to their father about many things. Mm -hmm. To me, I could talk to him. And when my injuries happened, he was by my side, and he would take me to rehab and uh, all of that. So like, he was a great father. My father was a he was a str he was strict, but he was a great father. He always supported us he uh it was easy to talk to and uh and he's clearly a, always top of mind for you i mean you uh, father's day happened not too long ago and you um you did a tribute uh with the family around but to your dad and you exactly. had a, uh, and and i I know you lost him uh, just uh, uh, yeah. not that long ago it was a couple of years yeah, ago two thousand fifteen um uh, how how did you deal with that uh to be honest with you, um, well, I lost him through cancer and he had multiple myeloma and his type of cancer was the type that was not sort of like, I mean, it was fourth level when we found out. And um, he just couldn't go get chemotherapy because it affects your, your blood and bone. So if you get chemo and radiation th that you know starts destroying your bone and breaks you down faster. But they would give you these pills that would have some chemotherapy in it and just reduce the time. So. At the time that he found out, they said he's got six months to live, you know what I mean? So uh, the six months, you know, it, it turned to six years. Mm. And, uh, you know, like he just, you know, suffered so much as it started getting, you know, towards the end of it and, and, and so on. So, uh, again, I had another almost like so many memories from that time you know that with him so it's kind of like you know they, they said that when you become older you become a kid again mm. so it we would reminisce on a good day with all of that and uh you know what was the main question again well, I, I just i, I mean yeah, the, the just, fact yeah. that he was your dad yeah. he's he was your professional coach and he was your best friend yeah that, exactly that's, that that's was the lot. best friend thing so we became that best friend thing, exactly, that's what I was getting at. That re happened again towards the end. So, you know, that I saw him at his week, and he just didn't want anyone to know. Like many of his students asked me, why didn't you tell us that is, I'm, I'm listen, I would put up a picture with my father on Instagram. Uh, unfortunately, this, I'm going to say it's in your show, like I don't care, like, you know, Persians, unfortunately, we uh, pay more attention to people that we lose than when they're in this planet with mm. us. You know, when my father was here, other than 15 20 of his students will not ask how he's doing how's the master how this that and as soon as he passed away all of a sudden you know i would put a picture with him on facebook and get 20 com uh, 20 likes not even comments all of a sudden as soon as he passed away the, the, yeah. this started you know Ru heshun shot everybody's like you know this this and all like poems and poems and honestly, I would really love, and I pass this message all the time in my Instagram when I talk about things. I'm like, guys, just love each other more when you're in this planet. You know, appreciate each other, learn from each other. You could have used them. Now I got this cutter tape set after all that. And all you write is under the cutter tape, you write, uh, Ruhe shot. Like, you know, hmm. God bless him, God bless him, God bless him. I said, you're not even putting this cutter that he put his sweat and blood on the line on your story and sharing it with your students. So. Anyways, love you, Dad. And uh, yeah, we were best friends. We were father, son. We were best friends. We were uh, everything. He was he was my everything. And uh, how I dealt with this was very hard. I was very broken. Even though he, he died in my arms, you know, the hospital called us and they told us um, he's breathing in a way that we know he's going to go soon, so please make it here. We rushed to the hospital and uh, I, I hugged them and 
just uh, in his ears. I just said, listen, you suffered enough. Just let go, you know, let go. And uh, he did. And uh, when he let go, just, whew. I don't want to get emotional here, but um, for three weeks I was messed the ceremony. We had like a really nice ceremony for him. We d it was almost like a military ceremony. We we had the karate lineups and we did the Japanese talk and bowing to him the way we did in the class. Mm -hmm. And um, three weeks later, I just was just destroyed. One day I was having lunch and um, this is real. My God knows I'm telling the truth. I just said, God, can you just show me some sign that he's in peace, that he's doing well, that I, I just shouldn't be so broken right now. and. He doesn't want me to be like this and just show me a sign that he's happier and where he is. Like I have a crystal, uh, little beatrin kind of a thing with my crystals are in it, like mm -hmm. a you know, stand. And all these crystals, they started like vibrating. That never ever happened before, ever. And never happened after that. For a minute and a half, I filmed it. I can show it to you if you want just vibrating non-stop and I'm like this is impossible I started I walked towards it I filmed it and then it stopped after a minute and a half so oh. that day put closure and that changed my way of doing things and this is the peers that you see now peers Varasta I I thank you for your uh, positivity for what you what you bring to the community and um, for sharing the story today and and for trying to convince me to wake up at 5 a.m. Uh, <laughs> well, let's, let's go with the six one. No, be out at six. Yeah, I'll be, be there. I'll six. be. I, I, I'm up for it. Actually, I'll, I'll come once with you if it makes your life easier. We'll no, go. We'll do hiking. Well, of course, I'm going to come with you. We'll, what are you? I'm going to go by myself. Or no, I'm going to no, come no, with no, you. I'm just saying, Can yeah. Oogie come? No, since I'm Can not. Can Oogie the dog yeah, come? We'll, you bring Oogie, and I bring Rex, and we'll. Uh, that's I it. We'll do it. this. I love it. We'll do Thank it. you, brother. Thanks for this. It's a pleasure being here. I appreciate this, John. Thank you very much. Professional fitness trainer, wellness coach, former European and Canadian champion in karate and bodybuilding, Piruz Varaste. Uh, you can find Piruz under his name on Instagram and follow his personal fitness advice and routines. Piruz Varaste, join me in the Rook studio today. This is full time for Rook for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, our website is the hub of all things Rook. The hub of all things Rook. If you want any information about us our contact information our previous episodes our guests our funnies our videos our different programs as part of the rook media network rookmedia.com r-o-q-e media.com where you can also support us and subscribe thanks to the amazing team who put this show together savvy roham talented anahita ponta the artist the fabulous key on super patty saw smart pega captain reza and groovy shaya thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content please subscribe if you've not done so already and tell a friend to do so as well find me on instagram at gian gomeshi mizunbashin